Hi, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are here at YouTube, uh, you can see a little button down below and you click on that and you get to Zoom and you see a little button down below or a little uh, link down below and you click on that and you end up in Mukana. And that's where you can ask questions. Uh, you can chat with other people that are watching the show and be part of the conversation. If you watch this and you think that you could actually add something to it, if you, you have something to add to the, to the conversation, then join the panel. We'd love to have you. Uh, you just need to be here by 6.40 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We do the mic checks um, between 6.40 and 6.43. If you're not here by then, you need to come to the next day. Uh, you can come as early as six. And what we recommend is if you're not sure, if, if, even if you're in the panel and you want to check out something, or if you're not sure you should be in the panel or you want to work on a couple ideas, uh, then, then come at six o'clock and you can kind of work through um, you know, how your video looks and how your audio looks. And that's a great time to experiment. So, uh, so definitely uh, you know, that's, the, that's the time to come in and, and hang out with us. If no one wants to experiment, we just talk about whatever we talk about. So, uh, so that's at six o'clock. Um, at seven, we start the general questions. So you can ask any question you want around media or virtual production. And then the second hour is something that we think is more important. So today, uh, or not more important, but something we'd like to spend an hour talking about. Today, we're going to talk about the future of concerts. Um, I think we, we had a good conversation about that you know, on um, Sunday when, when we weren't recording. Uh, and, and so we thought we'd bring it in and talk about it again. So, uh, so anyway, so we're going to talk about that in the second hour. Uh, tomorrow, just a quick reminder, is the remotes, uh, the, our, our band, the band for the office hours is going to be showing off the first song and talking about it. So that's going to be a great second hour. Also a reminder that the uh, we'll do education on Saturday, the last Zoom OSC uh, session with Andy Carluccio is going to be uh, at nine o'clock. And at 10 o'clock, we're starting up the Resolve training. Um, as a reminder, in the emails that go out to everyone, the resolve there's a there is a coupon code for resolve and uh in that coupon code uh you can get half off which i think is like the, low, the lowest that ripple training goes um and watch those videos uh today or tomorrow play with resolve a little bit come with questions this is not the, it's not a class we don't do classes here <laughs> so so it is a q a session assuming that you did some work in resolve and resolve and thought about it before you came. Now, you don't need to buy anything to, to come to it. You can just come and hang out and ask questions about Resolve. You don't need to buy their training to be part of that. Um, but the more we buy, the hopefully the more interest we get from Ripple uh, so that they, uh, they want to do it again. All right, Bill, let's go ahead and take it away. Okay, diving in. Dave Chalmers has our first question this morning from Glasgow, Scotland. I've attended several virtual trade shows recently. All were terrible. Who would have guessed? What do the panel think is the best way to replace walking the halls at a trade show with an online experience? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. And then Chris. Uh, move it to 24-7 like we do with Discord, where you can interact with people and then you can have uh, events where you can have an offline Zoom and you can have a direct one-on-one -on -one with that person to like interact with them. That's what you get running into people at a trade show and you can do that 365, 24-7. Yeah, Chris. I think the answer is that somebody needs to build something akin to what Instagram's explore function is. And um, I'm thoroughly amazed at how when I hit that little magnifying glass at the bottom of the screen, everything it shows me, I'm kind of interested in. And it's based on things I've already clicked on and looked at. And if you built a user interface for your virtual event where people could buy into that screen, it would show them things that they're interested in based on what they register, you know, data they gave while you reg while they registered. But it would also just be a place where you could scroll through and then everything would say, if you want to hear more, we're going to do a live presentation at noon or we're going to do something at that or we're having a social thing at this. And you click on it and could go to different meetings or gatherings or whatnot. Um, I love the explore function in Instagram. I think pe somebody needs to really build something around that. Go ahead, Bill, and then Roscoe, and then we'll move on. Um, I think what, it's what Alex has said, and I've come to really believe he was right about that. It's when you try to take something you used to do and virtualize it and keep it the same way. The idea that you're still thinking about walking halls, I understand that underneath that, you want to explore the event. But if you start with how you used to do it, it's very hard to break away and find the way you probably should do it for the future. Go ahead, Roscoe. Uh, it was a really interesting discussion in Clubhouse last night. And basically the idea that when you meet in the hallway in Zoom, you, you have perfect fidelity. You can hear clearly the person who might have been at the center of the circle when you're in the hallway. And so it's a really interesting experience. I think Zoom actually will, will improve the hallway experience. So yeah, leverage it. 
I, I, the, the one thing I'll say is, uh, go ahead, Guy, real quick, and then I'll. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to pull up a demo yep. here so that uh, you can see what it looks like on Hopin when you're in this kind of virtual space where you get to cruise through, and it'll say, are you ready? So you have your camera. So, so just to preframe, this is, this is a show, and then after the show, you have this networking selection where you can go in here and you can say, hey, um, I want to network with people, and it's like speed dating. And so you'll meet the next person connecting to your match. The person pops in. And then you can choose to bail with that leave thing in the top right. And you got two minutes and 52 seconds to talk to somebody. And if you want to connect with them, you could connect with them on LinkedIn. Uh, it's, it's really, really cool. Actually, they're pressing connect right there, you can see. I and so that will give them your information. But you can go through, I, I went through probably 20 people at a Hopin event. And it was just an interesting experience, something new uh, that I hadn't seen with the other platforms before. I, I think that the issue is, is that, and I, and I, and I admit from, from my experience with office hours that I feel like there's a lot of these forced things that we're trying to do that we can, we can go and get sp speed dating and everything else. And, and, and the, the issue is, is that I just feel like what we figured out how to do is organically collect people around something that they're interested in and then let them just find each other. I mean, we have a band now that is all playing together and everything else, you know, based on interacting. And so I understand, you know, like there's, hard ways to do it. I mean, it takes work to build a community, but I think that it's, um, but I, I, anyway, I'm not, you know, for me, I think that when I look at Frame.io, when we're talking about expo, expos specifically, when I look at what Frame.io did last week, that's the beginning of what I see as the future. Um, so I see their keynote as the future of keynotes. I see what they did last week. You had an incredible demo done in front of hundreds of people. We were able to ask questions and get it from really smart people you don't have to have, so I was a demo artist, you know, for electric image a long time ago in the early nineties. I knew a lot, but I didn't, I wasn't the guy. I mean, the person to, to ask questions. I was a demo person that could do the best I could because you have to have eight people at a booth that are covering a bunch of different computers and they're doing the best they can to answer your questions. And they're, they're smart about it, but they're not like the people. When you multiply it over top of a virtual event, you can bring in the person you know, that, that, that does it, let them talk to everyone, let them have an open Q and a, the biggest problem that we have and what frame IO fixed for us last week was they brought, they brought their a game, you know, they, they had a, they had an 8k camera, but they were switching between cameras. They had obviously rehearsed what they were going to talk about. And they had people that could answer the question specifically. And, you know, I, the only, my only regret about last week is that they, you know, that, that we didn't have 10,000 people watching, you know, but I think that, um, the, pro the biggest challenge we have with second hours when we bring people in uh, for this is that they don't bring their A game. They don't bring switchers. They don't bring good cameras. They're not ready for it. They're ready to just talk about it. And that's fine. And we're, we're fine with that. But, but the, what we, the goal in a lot of ways is to build those second hours into a, something where we're bringing people in all the time to either talk about subject matter or talk about products or talk about, you know, and, and as we grow this uh, to a larger group of people, you know, I think that, you know, I don't, I don't really believe in the expo anymore. Like I don't believe in being limited by time and space, you know? And so the idea is, is that we should be rather than waiting until April or waiting until October or September for IBC or whatever, what I'm trying to build as a pipeline where we just get to learn about something new every day, you know, <laughs> and, and it's, you know, and it's a constant, you know, process rather than uh, an individual one. And I think that, um, but I think that the problem is, is these companies will spend a hundred thousand dollars on their booth, um, but we can't get them to spend three thousand dollars on the equipment that they would need in their office to powerfully interact about their product, you know. And and the little bit of, and you know, they'll spend months working on the booth, and they won't spend, you know, more than a couple minutes trying to figure out how they're going to present in front of hundreds of people. And I think that's the problem. And I think that when when they figure that out, we're not going back to expos. Next question. TJ Asher, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and here on the panel is in with, he wants to talk about stereo in-ear monitors. The Ear Hero kit for sports is about $150. An-ear 360 Dual is about $250. The Bubble B Sidekick 2, $350. All, is the N-ear or Bubble B worth the extra $100 to $200 over Ear Hero? Is there a better alternative with better sound quality fidelity for less than an Alex or close to it? Discuss. A couple of people here have Bubble Bs, right? Um, I have ear heroes. I don't have a bubble bee yet. <laughs> Guy. I like the bubble bees, but the, the thing is that they're harder to get in. And so this is what they look like. I mean, geez, it's mm -hmm. like the, you could see one gray hair that I have. There's about the same width in terms of the, uh, that's the cable right there. 
And then that's how discreet it is. So if you need discreet, I like the bubble bees, but I still find myself reaching for my $99 just Sennheisers that come with the IE 500 uh, in your monitors. And they're just so fast to put in and they sound better because they fully encapsulate. They're, they're really in there. And so I hear the full bass. Now the, the bubble bees come with three different cones. So you can get more bass or get more environment depending on you know the ceiling that you do. So there's like a Christmas tree one, a cowboy, cowbell one. And then another one that's something else, a satellite, I think they call it. And so they're, they, they all sound pretty good once you get to that, you know, $300 level. It's just from there, it's discreet or, um, you know, comfort. And the one thing I'll say is that beyond whether they're comfortable or whether they're, they sound better, if you're using them in a public environment with clients, just always remember that everything that you do and everything and how you look affects how clients look at you. And we pay attention to all those little things. Coming in with Ear Heroes makes you look slicker <laughs> you know like you know just that little wire and you may not think that that's important but when you start working with high-end clients it, it they register all of those things um bill and then mickey yeah i use the n ear when i'm on the show uh for me the only thing is it's not full full spectrum and that low end even if i put the other um little shield on it mm -hmm. it's still tuned for speech because those came out of the security industry. I'm not saying that all right. of these are the small ones have, but those right. were designed to make speech as clear as possible. They don't have a lot of low end. So I wouldn't be monitoring music on them. Mickey and then Hosmuk and then we'll move on. Yeah, I haven't compared the ear heroes to the N ear and the bubble bees. And uh, I think we figured out a couple of days ago that the N ears and bubble bees are exactly the same. We we're speaking with uh, John Olson about that and he compared both exactly the same thing. But for uh, something less than an Alex with better sound quality or fidelity, definitely the uh, definitely you can find uh, units that sound better at uh, compared to the Bubble Bees because the the Bubble Bees the and ears the ear heroes are designed for being discreet, not ne not necessarily uh, sound quality. So you know I, I use the Shure SE four two fives and the five three fives, and those are definitely less than an Alex. And you might also want to look at the uh, stuff from Westone and uh, uh, there 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 are a lot of uh, good manufacturers out there. Uh, that are that make in ears that are designed more for music listening. Good husband. Yeah, I tried the same Sennheiser that Guy tried. I found them very uncomfortable. For comfort, the Bubble B Sidekick with the satellite tips work very well. I can wear them all day and not take them off. So that's the big upside. Maybe the sound quality is not that good, but it's good enough for vocal office hours participation. Another quick reminder for everyone, if you, we have enough questions, you don't have, I don't want to push you to ask any more questions, but do vote on the questions so that we know which ones you want us to answer first, because there is definitely going to be a speed round at the end of this hour. Um, go ahead, Bill. Next question. Moving on, we come to Rich Danby of uh, Rugby UK and Rich asks, which mini point of view camera do you rate? Looking at the AIDA or IDA HD NDI 200, which seems good other than the included lens. I need to get them on IP. So ideally they should have a built-in encoder. Built-in encoder. I don't, I don't think I have an answer. I think we might've been stumped. There's like these weird little holes that we just don't have a lot of people that are, are on any given day. And I think that we missed it on this one. Sorry. You don't have a good answer there. Go ahead, Roscoe. Do you have any? I mean, I like FOSS cams. Those those have built-in encoders mm -hmm. and ship over IP. I I use them all the time, but they're in a home security system, and they're great. Yeah. yeah. Next, next. Oh, go ahead, guy. Sorry, I was going to reach for it. I actually have the Huddle Cam in NDI, so it's a uh, four hundred ninety-nine bucks, and it is that same one that's USB, but it's NDI, and it's that same eight X uh, push in. So it's a four K camera with the ability to zoom in up to eight X, but it becomes digital. So if you're do, doing HD, it'll be you know uh, optical up until 4x, and then uh, when you start to push in beyond that, it starts to become digital. But it's it's worth looking at. The only thing is it's a little tougher to set up on NDI because you actually got to set an IP address to it. So I'm not in love with it for that part. Um, and I have the ADA cameras as well, not in the NDI world, but in the the SDI world, and those are pretty decent image quality. Actually, the HDMI one is one that we use on some shoots. So uh, if you can try both, I mean. Uh, why not? If you can find a result that'll sell it to you, and then you can return it and pick pick the winner of the two. Go to Jeff, and then Dave, and then we'll move on. The other brand to look at is Marshall cameras. 
Yeah, I was going to say Marshall, but also I think PTZ Optics have some little box cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have NDI outfit as well. Sounds good. All right, next question. Brian Anderson, often here on the panel, Silver Springs, Maryland. I've been asked to research interactive immersive 360 video for a project. What are the tools, techniques, and processes I should be looking at for production, post, and delivery? I mean, the things that you want to look at for, I mean, the question is really interactive. Like, what do you want to, how, you, how do you want to interact with uh, the 360? And you're talking about putting on like a Oculus type solution, Brian? Uh, potentially on Oculus, maybe in the browser so you're not tied to hardware. The interactivity would be like clickable hotspots that might branch, take you places, or give you information about an object. Yeah, the, the, the interactivity I don't think is super well developed, you know, in, in that process. I mean, it, that's real. There's not really any, a lot of great authoring tools, in my opinion, to do that. Um, the thing with video is the acquisition. Are you talking about a 3D environment or are you talking about video acquisition? Video. Yeah, so what you want to look for in cameras, I mean, there's a, a lot of reasonably good cameras. Uh, Insta360, I think, are, are the ones that I've shot with most recently. Um, the, uh, the thing you want to look at is low light performance, if you need that. Um, a lot of them have smaller sensors. And then you want to know how close or how far away, you know, so the issue with, with that is really that as you get closer to the camera, those lenses, those sensors are not right on top of each other. And so... The issue you get into is that you get um, some seams. If you get really high, as you go higher resolution, you got five or six, seven camera, or you know, eight cameras or whatever shooting, you get seams where they overlap. Now they do a pretty good job of fixing that, but as you get closer to them, so where those kinds of 360 don't work really well is less than three feet, you know, to the to the um, uh, to the to the piece where you start to get where they just can't quite make that work. And a lot of times you can fix it for a close up, but, but then it won't work off in the distance. You can fix it for the distance of so where you're doing that stitch and how you're doing it makes a big difference. Um, the one place that you can, if you don't need a ton of resolution, um, it'll still look good. But if you look at like the new thetas, the, the high end thetas that are nearly 6K or maybe they're 6K now. Um, the nice thing about them is they're really easy to grab footage. Um, and it is uh, they are, um, they're relatively easy to grab footage and also they don't have very few seams because of the way that they manage the, um, uh, the sensor. So, so I think that that, it just depends on how, how high resolution, a lot of stuff we're working on, we want higher resolution than what they're capable of, or we want stereo, uh, 360, cause that's a whole nother problem, um, that you get into. Uh, so that, those are the things to think about as you go into it. Yeah, Brian. Picture, you know, maybe tour in the Washington mall you know, looking at monuments. So it wouldn't be necessarily close. You could be far off and get a view of things, but being able to click on things, get information on Lincoln or that kind of an idea, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you can definitely do it. You know, the, the hard part right now is that the market is not very big. And so, you know, what I would probably attach to it is use something that's easier to, to shoot with for now um, to, to get the concept out. So I wouldn't spend a lot of money on hardware, especially if you're doing something outside. I would probably start with a Theta and figure out how to get the interactive features working before I started spending real money on, on, a, uh, on, a, on an immersive camera. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, yeah, and that's like, I've looked at the cameras and the acquisition and I think I've, I can figure that out. It's the delivery and the interactivity part where I, the tools, I don't know. There's not really, start. I haven't really seen a lot of good tools in that area. Um, there are definitely for compositing and adding some of those bits and pieces that's all built into the, into Apple's, you know, fi in Final Cut and Motion um, have a lot of good tools. I would imagine those are going to get better. Apple seems to be very focused on, on 360. So, so um, it's a good time to figure it out, but I don't think, I think a lot of the tools are still a little behind. Um, yeah. So good luck. The, the AR, uh, AR stuff is much more developed than, than the VR. So uh, using things like uh, uh, AR creator or AR yeah, creator um, to, to kind of throw things in there, uh, you have to have a little bit of coding, but uh, I think you're going to see more tools for interactivity in AR than VR because the VR video especially is challenging as someone who's been doing it for 15 years. <laughs> so next question. Uh, John M. Gerard of Berkeley, California. Zen with, I got the Logitech Brio for my niece. What software do we need to install to allow her to perform all the color corrections? This is on the Mac, by the way. I just got an update to Zoom, and now my MacBook Pro early 2011 is working. Well, congratulations, John. Go ahead, Hosmuk, and then Roscoe, and then Bill, and then we'll move on. I use webcam from MacTaras. It's about $8 on the App Store. And that's and webcam settings? Very, that's webcam settings, yeah. Yep. It, the, the developer is Mactaris. Mm. Great. Uh, Bill? 
Uh, there is a Logic Capture app that comes with it's the Brios that gives really you basic control. It's, it's super basic, but it is there if you want to just. But play. on the Mac, it's really frustrating. Like it's almost unusable. Like I wouldn't use the Logitech software on the Mac. I mean, I think you might have to use it on the PC, but I, I really try to get it to work. And compared to webcam settings and manual camera, it is just like drawing with a brick. Um, Roscoe. Yeah, I threw in the link into Makana, and I also threw it through in Erian, which is a free app that allows you to pull the webcam into Zoom and use it all over the place. That's great. Next question. Courtney Gooden of Holland, Hollywood, who was just talking to us, said, after Alex's Telestrator demo, I was looking for a Windows drawing tool and couldn't find one I liked. I think TJ Asher discovered a Photoshop mode that works, and I wrote a, window, and I wrote a Windows Telestrator program yesterday that I can demo. The busy <laughs> Let's see guy. It. Let's see it, Courtney. <laughs> Show us the show us the Telestrator. Okay, let's see. Um, so I have it just running on my second screen here, right. and oh, it's backwards over there. But it has this little. Uh, you can slide it around by dragging it on the on the uh, title bar there, so you can drag uh -huh. it to a second screen and then maximize it. And then you can draw. Let me turn on my. Uh, oh gosh, it's confusing because I have it backwards on <laughs> on my screen. But uh, right, uh, let me. Turn on my downstream key and switch. There I am. Okay. And then you can, uh, F1 hides the, uh, click on it. F1 hides the menu. And there you go. Then, then you can draw and right, right mouse button, you know, draw with the left mouse button, right mouse button clears, and you can have different colors just by hitting number keys. And uh, in case you want to do, a, uh, a, I'm using pre-multiplied key, which seems to work pretty well. Uh -huh. And uh, I also have the ability to, you can choose custom colors up here if you want to. And it'll save your custom colors and you can change the size of your, of your drawing. Uh, I think we're going to single-handedly kill uh, off the, uh, <laughs> so if somebody, ruin somebody's business model for the glass, because it's just like, <laughs> it's just so much better. So, so you, you wrote want that to, in the uh, day? Pardon me. You wrote yeah, that, I wrote that yesterday after the, uh, and if somebody wants a, uh, uh, I see people are hitting me up on Discord already. I'll send yeah, yeah. You, I'll send <laughs> you a copy ding, ding, of the ding, program, ding, 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 ding. and you can install it on your own. It's it's cheaper than Photoshop, but TJ, are you running it? Are you running it on um, uh, the little B? You're, no, the... but it will. You know, it's it's just running on my second screen on my current computer. That's here. awesome. You know, because the the stuff goes in here. <laughs> That's where games out here. But can That's I use awesome. it with my Apple Pencil on my iPad? Yeah, and it won't yeah. run on Mac OS. Sorry. <laughs> all right. All right. Next yeah. question. Uh, Paul King of Northern Virginia says, what's the most effective way you've found to get buy-in for a client or group to use Frame.io to streamline post-production? The old adage is, what's wrong with email keeps popping up for us. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Ahead, Sorry, found my mute. Um, I say use it. There's there's free levels on Frame.io and find a small project, get some people who have influence to buy in. I've done that and people go, hey, this is kind of cool. Why can't we do more? Because you got to pay. I mean, uh, a lot of we, we're paying for it for our clients. So they're just receiving those things as far as that goes. But, um, but yeah, I, I started with it on family project and was like oh this is really easy my parents understand it and so and then after that you know you just keep on using it more and more but the, yeah the key is just to incorporate what you can into that and it doesn't cost very much um to uh to, to get it sorted um so it's you can get started pretty pretty easily um Hosmuk and then bill and then mickey Rel relatively quick we're still deep in questions not the same as frame io but we use vimeo and with a customer insisted that we're not going to do any edits unless they put it in the review on the platform so that's how we got them to use it. Right. Yep. Bill? What makes Vimeo, or what makes Frame.io a bit expensive over time is adding seats. So if you can keep your crews small, you can also, if you don't have a lot of storage, just make sure that you uh, download and flush your old large uh, raster projects to free up space and you can work with it relatively inexpensively. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I'm wondering if uh, Paul is talking about actually convincing clients to put notes in Frame.io as opposed to uh, a bulleted email which mm -hmm. a lot of e clients are, like doing and I agree with Hasmuk just tell them like this is where we're going to get our notes and uh, 
that that's it that's how that's a more efficient way of working and you'll get the better value tell them that they'll the client will get a be better value for the work um to, it's if they do it there it it happens pretty quickly i've never seen a client go in and say oh i don't want to use this anymore <laughs> like, like it's it once they get it off the ground like and they understand they can put stuff in it's just like okay well that's what they want to do because as soon as they go back to email it feels very painful uh, next question Moving on to David Brady of New York, going to rebuild my office and looking to save money on electricity. Are there any recommendations for smart power strips or power distribution systems or kit components? And obviously replace all your lights. Um, that'd be the first thing. And then the, uh, the second thing is get a kilowatt so that you know what, where a kilowatt is a little uh, power strip or power outlet that will tell you what you're drawing. It's really important to just know what those things are. Um, and then, one of the things that, that for things that are non-critical that don't need to be on, I have those on a home kit, you know, outlet so that I can on my phone, just turn them off and convenience saves probably more convenience of turning things on and off probably saves more than, than most other uh, things when it comes to turning, um, doing power when it's hard to turn on and off, it becomes painful and you don't do it. And then you burn up a lot of money. Yeah. And Jan's showing one of those kilowatts right there. Uh, next question. Uh, Talak Miguel Lopez Waterman, our friend said, if he is willing to, could Bill Davis talk about cultivating his announcing voice? It is so fantastic. First of all, thank you. I wish I could have a fraction of this poise. Eh, that's not a bad. Lots of listening practice, or is it just a natural ability? So uh, I can talk to, and also Alex Kennedy, because he's done a lot of announcing too. But for me, the key was back when I was dabbling with radio and a young man, uh, a program director at a station, Nat Stevens said, read the script. I did. He said, you're terrible. I think you got some talent. Go back and do it over and over again. I want you to read every day for 15 minutes, then come back and I'll see you again. I actually did that. I came back and he said, you're still terrible, but I could hear the difference. You're starting to get a little better. Keep doing it. He sent me back week after week. And the big lesson from that is you are what you do every day. You've got to practice. I don't care what you read, read the phone book, do it aloud every day into a microphone, start listening back then the other critical skill is learn how to read in thoughts, get them in and send them out rather than reading word by word. Yeah. I mean, the, the hardest part for voiceover is to be able to read ahead. So it's like, it's like learning to play the didgeridoo or the bagpipe or something, but it's circular breathing. Your eyes have to get up to one line or more ahead of it. So that, because what it allows your brain to do is figure out what it's going to do with those words um, subconsciously. Go ahead, Hosma. Yeah, I mentioned Morgan Freeman the other day on the golf course. The only question I asked him, how did you learn to speak like that? Have you always spoken like that? He says, my son, it took many weeks and hours of practice. So I evolved my style. Yeah. Next question. Moving on, TJ Asher from here on the panel in Minneapolis, Minnesota. For Resolve training, will the free version work or do we need to purchase the full $300 version? Go ahead, Roscoe. You're, you're muted. Free version will be great. And uh, I put a thing in for Tool Farm. Tool Farm has a good thing. It explains the difference between the studio version and the free version. Yeah, you should be able to do, I think, 80, 90% with the free version. So you shouldn't need to da um, buy it. Um, the one thing to note is do not buy Resolve from the App Store. You want to buy it from Tool Farm if you want to do it online. Um, but do not buy it from the App Store. It is limited. It is not the same app. Next question. Jason Robert Shaw of Sarasota, Florida says, friend asked me, I want a foot switcher to switch between Elmo and video, possibly remove the key. Have a Roland VR-4 HD AV mixer. Any suggestions by chance? My mixer is too far away from me during my programs to easily switch inputs by hand. Yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, there's some X keys that you can get. There's some foot pedals that allow you to play and right click, double click. Uh, and then you could probably tie these with Maestro, keyboard Maestro if you're on a Mac or some other software. But yeah, I'd look at those X keys. And the one thing you want to look at, at, at how much, how hard you want to use your foot. So I, X keys is what I was going to say as well. But I find that the big buttons, they have big colored buttons. And I find those better as foot pads than the foot pads. And the reason is that the, the travel and the resistance of the foot pads for X keys are pretty heavy. So um, combine, I use them specifically with the Telestrator that I showed yesterday. <laughs> I, I, used, I used a lot of these to bas basically switch between inputs as I was working. And I found that the resistance and, and travel on the foot pads made my uh, leg sore. 
<laughs> I did it all day. Uh, whereas the I could just tap the button with my foot and it, it worked well. It's just a closure. So you could build anything you want because those feed into a basically an eighth inch jack that is just measuring uh, closure. And so you can build anything you want that just closes. So there's lots of options once you get the, uh, the head unit for it. Next question. Moving on to Art by Junior. Art says, uh, after a while, uh, after white and black balancing an Ursa broadcast and white balancing a Ross pivot, pivot uh, they have no black balance. Both seemed correct on an RGB parade. I noticed when pointing at the Dumont chart that one of the color squares on the left looks yellow on one camera and green on the other. Why would that be? The RGB is, is not a super refined. It gets you into the ballpark, but it's not going to get you. You can't really match it um, with just the RGB parade. Uh, you can get um, things that are relatively close. But the way to do it, in my opinion, is, as, as I said before, especially the non-vector scope way to do this is to um, essentially put the Dumont chart in, cut it with a, with a rectangular transition so that one camera's on the inside, the other camera's on the outside, and you're cutting through all the colors. When you can see a line, it's not, it's not set up. When, you, when the line disappears, they're totally matched. Now, the thing is, is that you'll have much more control, I believe, with the Ursa than you will with the Ross. So you'll have to match the Ursa to the Ross. So get the Ross as close as you want to exactly what you want and that it looks, looks the way you want it. Then match the Ursa to it because it won't have the Ross won't have the, the tools to do it well. Uh, next question. Mark Hadley in Seattle is interested in talking about the Mukana interface we use for our Q&A processing. And uh, he starts with a hashtag and then says, I have an idea for a question, but it's not the right time to ask. I can click on the notes icon and make a note to myself for later. When I ask a question, there's a similar note button. Is that private to me? What is the use case for notes in Mukana? There is two notes. We probably should state it. There's a note for you in, inside of Mukana that you can just save ideas um, anytime you want, and that's there in your user. The second note is if you want to add something, you want to annotate your question later. The reason we put that in there is because we can't let you edit your, your questions because at scale, uh, you could get a bunch, get something voted up and then change the meaning of it with a word, you know, um, so, or even a comma. <laughs> so, so we can't, uh, so we can't have people change. That's why you can't change your Twitters. That's why you can't change, you know, but we do allow you to add a note to it so that um, you can explain something a little further if you, if you felt like later you do it. Now, some people will <laughs> use it to, to add a lot of, a lot of things like add more questions, but, but, uh, um, but we, we would prefer you just to clarify something if you feel like you have to um, go ahead, Brian, and we'll move on. Yeah. Are those notes persistent across sessions? Uh, yeah, the notes that the notes that you put in a notes, it, it's it's tied to your user. Yep. Next question. JJ McKenna, Santa Venetia, California. What's the most successful point of entry for people trying to get into voice acting? And how did Bill or Courtney get started? Go ahead, Bill. I, I do not do voice acting and I want to make this distinction really good. I'm an announcer and I know how to announce the people who can really do voice acting and whether that's cartoon voices or, or things like the audible book readers who I stand in absolute awe of who can manage seven or 17 characters, keep them distinct for the listener, do gender dip reversals, do aliens that have no gender. Those people amaze me. And I just, I think they're, one of the highest points of this art. I go ahead, Courtney, and then Mickey, and then Jan, real quick. Yeah, just look online for voiceover teachers, and I guess nowadays they're doing them virtually. Um, but most of the ones in my neighborhood, uh, you know, used to conduct in-person classes where they could put you on microphone and look for one that does animation because that gives you, like mm -hmm. Bill said, a lot of variety and lets you jump out of your skin into a lot of different characters and so on and mm -hmm. and uh, really stretch. And, you know, most most classes will cost you about three to five hundred dollars for mm -hmm. maybe a month's worth of, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 classes, something like that. Good, Mickey. And yeah, on top of that, those voice classes are a good way to network with people who are, you know, in, in the same industry. And on top of that, I would also uh, suggest like getting sample scripts. Uh, there are a lot of them available online. Um, and also you can rip off other scripts from from content that's already uh, produced and just and create a reel. And mm -hmm. sense, if you're if you've done what you've what Bill mentioned earlier, wherein you know, just keep on practicing. Um, you can build a strong enough reel that 
you may feel confident enough to send to studios because they're we're always on the lookout for fresh talent because a lot of towns have uh uh they can't use their voice on competing uh a, a non-compete uh in in their contracts with the client so we always need fresh talent uh go ahead jan recommend the blind always need people to read to them and there's magazines and news so you could you could volunteer for that because you do got to get a reel but what i definitely recommend is stay away from those classes because the only people that are given those classes are people that want to make money off of people that that can't make it any other way so it's like holding out a carrot and you never get there those people just so, want to take your money oh all i'll say is that i took uh i took three classes um when I was in Denver and I was trying to, you know, decide to tune up, I had already done a lot of work. Um, and I ended up, my teacher was the person who did, for those of you who are old enough that did the, um, the lollipop, you know, one, a two, a three, you know, like that, that, that person, and he's a funny guy, but, uh, those three classes changed more about how I do my, use my voice and speak than anything else I've ever done. So it's, you know, so having a good trainer who can do it, it's like having a good coach. Um, so it's really hard to do it on your own. Uh, one thing that I would say, though, is the most important thing is to do it a lot. It's just practice. Uh, one of the things that I play with every once in a while, I'm hidden. I'm not going to tell you what my, my handle is, but I play with for fun is a hitrecord.org, uh, which is uh, from Joseph Gordon-Levitt. He puts stuff up on things. And, but what he does is he challenges people to do, you know, they wrote something and then you, they ask you to do it. And I just do it for fun. But every once in a while, they send me a check. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just like, I don't even know what happened to it. I don't know where it showed up, but I get, I get a check for, you know, a little bit of money. And I'm like, I don't know exactly how this all works, but what's, what's fun about it is that someone else had thought through it, you know? And, um, and so, and I'm experimenting with it cause I think it's an interesting platform. And, uh, so anyway, hit record.org uh, is, is a place that you can find things to go play with, um, and, uh, and practice your skills. Uh, I, I don't use my name cause I, I'm just playing. So, uh, so anyway, so you can do that too, but it gives you the, the, you don't have to think up what you're going to say. You just, there's things that are embedded already and they give you kind of guidance towards it, much like you would have when you do animation. Um, but like everything else, having someone good to give you feedback and then practicing like every other instrument or every other athlete, it's just, you know, you got to do 10,000 reps. Um, next question. Brian Carpenter and Medina says, sorry for Tuesday's confusing question. I'm looking for a collection of human hand gestures panelists make on camera while muted, such as twisting both hands to applaud. Are there some for someone who needs to mute, getting off topic and so forth? WebEx reported uh, auto interpret some of these. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, I put a link in for floor manager hand signals, which are traditionally used because you can't speak. You have to communicate to the talent who's in front of the camera. So that would work in Zoom, I think. Next question. Moving on to John M. Gerard of Berkeley, California for the Gator Framework short weighted base microphone stand. And I got, oh, he got that. And he got a pile PDM IC42 retro mic. What adapter do I need to buy? Uh, I need the holder part that screws into the stand. Mm. Just check Marker all Tech. Googling. Mark, Marker Tech mic stand mounts. You will find a thousand of them and they adapt anything to anything. So you just have to know Good. the threads going yeah. in and Good. going out. Good. Good, Jeff. Looking at that pile, it looks like an old style Sure mic that has it integrated right next to the XLR connector. Uh, this would be a great thing to go on Discord and give us some pictures of what you have and we can diagnose exactly what you need. A lot of times there, the, the most common one that you have to convert is mic to three eighths. I mean, that's usually what the, it's, it's going one, one, either three eighths to mic or mic to three eighths is probably between the different mic stands. Rarely do we have to do quarter inch. Now what I do is I have a, I have a little box full of all of those. So I have, they're very inexpensive, but a pain to find when you need them. So I have mic to three eighths, mics to mic to quarter, quarter to three eighths, quarter to, you know, you know, all of those converters. Yeah. And I just have a, I, you, you, you know, for 20 bucks, you can have a bag full of them and, and then you just uh, mix and match as you need uh, because you just, you'll need them and you'll need them now. And uh, it's just easier to get ahead of it. Next question. 
John Landy of uh, Jan Landy, I'm sorry, here in, from Las Vegas. Is there a reason or is it a bug that you cannot edit your question in Mukana after you submit? The only way I can change my question is to copy and then delete and replace it as a new question. I actually explained that a second ago. Yeah, you can't can't change it because you can change the meaning. And so in a voting structure, anytime you add voting, you really have to take away uh, the capability of editing. Next question. Michael Marsh in San Anselmo says stubborn hard drive has 25 small millisecond DOS part. Oh, MS DOS. Oh, MS DOS partitions that all mount on Mac. Every attempt with disk utility and elemental terminal commands cannot erase or remove partitions. Any suggestions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah. On disk utility, what you want to do is you want to go into view and then click show all devices. And what you want to format is the device itself, not just the partition. So you select the device, the drive itself, and hit erase there, and that should clean that up. Next question. Uh, Nick, pra uh, Nick Prager of Des Moines, Iowa, looking for a countdown timer that can be used in a Zoom webinar for my presenter's best options. Good guy. One of the free ones is uh, this one from streamtimer.us. You get that kind of look in a browser. You just set up the back end here. It's totally free. Again, you set the time, you can change themes, and then this would be what you can have the pretty look for the uh, end users, or you can have the more of the studio look, and then you can zoom it in and make it big or whatever you want to do. That's the recommendation. And that's a, that's a great, that's screen timer. Is that right? Stream timer. I just put the link in Mukana. Stream timer. Okay, great. Yeah, and and I, um, I will say that if you have the time and the budget, or just the time, <laughs> uh, I build a lot of these from scratch uh, in Motion, um, mostly because I use it as part a branding opportunity for the for the event. So uh, you know, I want to use the same fonts. I want to make it look. I want to put backgrounds into it and everything else. And so I I try to add to that, but definitely doing something is better than nothing. Um, and, and that's a great app to just throw it together and you can do a lot of customization there. Um, and also Memo Live will support, you know, build its own. Um, but I, I, I like to render mine out because I, and throw them into a play out just because it looks really pretty. And I know it seems like that's a crazy thing to do, but you really like adding those little things is how you um, build things up. Anyway, Bill. If you're on a Mac, Mini Timer is a small app that costs mm -hmm. almost nothing. If it does cost anything, it is real solid and reliable. There's also one called by the folks who make um, uh, Playback Pro make one called Screen Time, I think. And the nice thing about it is, is you can speed it up. So you can, <laughs> so you can change it's, it's, uh, it. You can put it up there and we can play with it and make it like 1.1, 1.2. Guy, does that one do that? Does Stream Timer do that? So you can actually speed up the, the, um, uh, the timing. No, it's, no, it's, it's super sad. powerful. It's super powerful because you can pull speakers back in the line when you're when your timing is off you give them a speaker time that's a little bit faster and you're able to pull 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 a show back back in if you if you want to go ahead jan excuse me wirecast has it in built in it's free in, in wirecast okay great uh, next question next question comes from jan landy in las vegas i noticed that in the toolbar at the bottom of this webinar meeting there's a record button i have been tempted to click on it but the fear of disrupting office hours has kept me from clicking on it can someone tell me what the button will do if i click on it it might record it it's not a big deal during the show but but i, I don't know if i gave that option and i don't know why it's there now now that i look at it so uh, michael I thought it was there for uh, if we want to be able to record and save it to our own hard drive. That's I, that's what I read uh, about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I thought that I'd turn that off. That's why I'm confused. It must ha Hasma, Hasmuk is saying no. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Hasma. Yeah, I, I I clicked on it, <laughs> and it says please ask the host to give you permission to record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, because I, I was like, I don't think I gave that that option. <laughs> Next question. Okay. I think I used that once in like the first week and Alex came on and said, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's a good low cost 2D animation tool, says JJ McKenna of Santa Venetia, California, that doesn't demand a dedicated computer with some templates? Low cost 2D animation. What kind of animations do you want to do? I think is the question. There's a lot of different kinds of animation. Character animation, logo animation. Character animation. So if you wanted to do... Um person walking across the screen, sorry, I'll be a quieter. Uh, person walking across the screen or, or just building something. There are a number of apps for uh, Droid devices. 
So and, and you're looking for the, is it what what platform? Android. Android. Oh, so you want an animation tool for Android, so not a PC. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't have any answers for that. So if anyone um, would use something like that. Yeah, the one that the only one that I've used in the past is Toon Boom, which is not. I don't think it's free. It's it's, it's one that's a pretty popular uh, uh, platform for that kind of thing. But it's a, it's like a. If I remember it, it was pretty pro app. Um, the, I mean, the, yeah, I, I don't know how to do it in Android. Uh, we'll have to think about that one. I'll, if I see it, we'll, we'll we'll talk about it again. Next question. Bill Cordell of Charleston, South Carolina says, I'm looking for a timeline-based software that can generate LTC timecode and send network triggers. Audio and video on the same timeline would be a bonus. Stability is more important than budget. Timeline-based software that can generate LTC timecode. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I was going to bring this up later. Uh, QPilot is an app that uh, can put, has a timeline. It can produce LTC timecode. It also can send OSC commands. You can have multiple uh, timelines of OSC commands, and it can also control a vision switcher. Wow, that's like... Good answer. All right. Next, next also, question. It can also automate PDZs, but we'll talk about that in a second hour. Yeah, I, I, I'm uh, going to check that out. Uh, next question. JJ McKenna here from Santa Venetia. Uh, are breakout rooms available in Zoom webinars? Not yet. Uh, they, they have talked about the fact that they're going to make them available, but they're not available yet. I think we're expecting it in the next quarter. Um, I think that's what they said, but they, I think they talked about it at Zoomtopia last uh August or September um, that they're working on it. So next question. Jan Landy here uh, in the panel from Las Vegas. After all the weather challenges people are facing with electricity, I've been thinking about getting a generator. Does anyone have any ideas or suggestions on what to buy? Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, the uh, Generac is the one that we did, Whole House, and uh, we have uh, used it many, many times. So great, great piece. I'm, uh, I've used Generacs in the past and I'm in the process of getting a uh, specking one out for my house. So I'm definitely going Generac as well. Uh, natural gas Generac, uh, you know, so, um, uh, Michael. Yeah, I, I was going to second or third that, but, uh, I would also get, uh, your own independent, uh, fuel source, something that's not going to depend on being piped in, uh, from elsewhere, because, uh, as we know, pipes freeze damage, you know, all that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure you've got a large, a large uh, tank fuel source that's going to support you for at least two weeks. I, I, and I don't need that. I, the reason I'm getting a generator is because I live in California. So, uh, so I don't, you know, we just never know if we're going to actually have power. Not that I'm bitter. Um, next question. Dan Burt and leads the UK says oldie but goodie first use camera to buy for use with an ATEM mini pro. Most usage will be teams and zoom for work meetings, allowing, uh, PPT and screen share cuts, split screens, and so forth. Go ahead, Hasman. Yeah, for the medical event, I use the Huddle Cam. It has both USB and HDMI. So put the HDMI straight in the ATEM, and it worked very well. You will eventually, if you have an ATEM Mini, you will eventually wish you had Blackmagic cameras because you can shade them and control them and focus them. And you, know, you have all this back-end control. So you just have to decide whether you're going to purchase, you know, buy once, cry once, or you're going to buy something incremental. There's a, there's a, there's a uh, I mean, incremental is fine. If you don't have the money, just get something incremental. Um, but just know that you're buying something incremental. Uh, if, if you get successful at it, you will absolutely buy a Blackmagic camera because uh, it's, so much easier <laughs> to be able to control your cameras from the switcher. It's, it's, an, it's an insanely, uh, incredibly useful thing. Go ahead, Hosman. Now, you know, I didn't buy a black magic yet. <laughs> Next question. Next question comes in from Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm looking into using Scopebox for an upcoming HDR production. What or who would be a good resource to learn the ropes of what to look for in the scopes? We've done a couple scope things. We had we had actually AJA come on and talk about scopes a little bit, but uh, I don't. Part of the reason I keep on coming back to oh, we should do another second hour on scopes is because I don't think there's a lot of good resources out there to talk about what to do with them, and we use them in a lot of different ways. Um, specifically with HDR, I had a little trouble with scope box, and so I I I, I would warn you that I'm not entirely sure that it's accurate, uh, Bill. Yeah, 
And, and I agree, there's not a whole lot of resources. One thing, Tektronix used to be a major hardware vendor of scopes, and they had some training videos for how to look at things like waveform monitors, vector scopes that explain them in pretty good detail. You might search the web and see if those Tektronix training videos are still out there. It won't tell you about the new stuff and it won't get you into the digital era, but it'll basically break down scope views and help you understand them. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the one that we probably use the most often is the waveform and the uh, RGB parade to make sure that we are staying inside of a thousand nits if you're doing HDR. I mean, uh, and what it does tell you, I mean, the most important things from those scopes is black levels and white levels is, is where the scopes really help a lot. And then you can do a lot of other things with them, but those are the things you'll look at the most is um, do I have my black levels all the way to black or to over black? Uh, do I have my whites all the way to white not going over whatever my target value is? Next question. Uh, Jan Landy, back again from Las Vegas. Keyboard maestro question. Yesterday I launched KM and all my shortcuts were gone. Does anyone know how I can restore them? I don't know if we have it. It's a good question. I just don't know if we have an answer for it. Um, I don't. Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. You may try in the document. Sometimes you'll you'll have a, you know, open recent under the file menu and possibly there was a file that was open that somehow got quit, a, a preference that was quit. It, it's a crazy idea. Next question. Uh, Jan, Le oh, I'm sorry, this is Peter Moore of Auckland, New Zealand. Just wondering if eh, Bill moonlights on MSNBC as Brian Williams, given his voice and demeanor, <laughs> very similar. No, no, no. We're talking about the difference between a professional football player and a peewee football player. It's actually Bill. That's why Bill can't do this in the afternoon is he ADRs for, uh, for Brian Williams every day. So he, you know, he's been doing it for years. You know, Brian, Brian actually is mute. You know, he just, he just, he, they just send Bill the script and he just, thank you out. for the compliment. That is very <laughs> sweet. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. If you saw uh, Brian Williams show last night and you wanted to see what a technical meltdown looks like, <laughs> look at that show. What, what Their happened? control room lost power and they tried oh, to go to him and he was, you could kind of see him and he looked very nervous. And they went to somebody in a newsroom somewhere and go, we don't know what happened to Brian Williams. And then they brought somebody else in who started reading the stories. And then you know, after about 15 minutes, they finally got him on the air. Apparently the main control room and all of their links to all the people they were going to have as guests on the show disappeared as the power went out in the main control room. It took them wow. about 15 minutes to recover. That's what a meltdown looks like. On Do not TV. conspiracy Why? link that with the fact that I was late this morning. They had nothing to do with it. I think you did it, Bill. You were you were the one that pulled the plug. <laughs> like, he, he, he can't talk. All right, next question. All right, move it on. Chris, uh, why... Widener of Lafayette, Indiana says, I started playing with Adobe Character Animator and I'm tempted to use it for a historical documentary for kids as the voiceover is there something as the voiceover. Is there something better I should look at? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. It's powerful. I love it. It's, it's really great. And if you need help, reach out to me on Discord. I think that Adobe's character, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a big fan of the Adobe's subscription model and I, I, I slag them every once in a while. Their character animation tools are the best publicly available tools that you can get in my opinion. Like they're, I mean, they're, they're that 2D animation tools on, on After Effects are just stunning. Like the, the, the capture tools, the facial capture tools. And Brian has done, he did it. You, you did a coffee thing with that, right? You, Oh, it was great. If you go yeah, back and look, I mean, if you can post that again in, in uh, Discord, Brian, just I'll, as a reference I'll find to this it. one. Yep. Um, it was just a great example. And I was like, how did he do that so quickly? And then I realized, uh, and then when he's talking about character animation tools, I was like, he's got talent and he knows how to use the, the those tools. But they're they're really, uh, um, really, really great tools. Um, if you want to do 2D animation, uh, they're pretty amazing. And there's so many things that can let you do it really, really fast. Um, and uh, we... I'm amazed. I just want to, I just want to let everybody here know that the panel did a great, so the audience, so for the, for the participants, you did an amazing job of stacking up questions at the beginning, letting us know how deep the water was going to be. So we saw that like, Hey, there's 20, 25 questions at the top of the hour. We need to move with velocity. And I just want to, I just want to, uh, kudos to the, to the panel. Uh, I think it was good, uh, good focused conversation. Uh, we got to the answers and we're still, 
the reason I'm able to talk about it and give everybody pats on the back and everything else is because we still have four minutes. I don't know how we got through so many questions so quickly. So, um, so really, really well done. I think we're, we're figuring out the new reality. We've got a couple more viewers than we've had in the past and people are learning to write those questions down between, um, shows, which is the important thing is that you want to write, uh, write your questions down during the day and then bring them in. Uh, you can put them in that little notepad if you want, uh, in that's already in Mukana. Um, and then, uh, and then bring them in. So, um, anyway, now we don't, now we don't know what to do with, with the other four minutes. I think we might start early, but we don't have Daria. So now we're in this, it is in between let's bring Tyler and Tyler raises his hand for the second. Uh, we, uh, let's bring him in and do a mic check. I, I assume that Tyler wants to talk about the second hour. We'll, we'll be a little bit more flexible because we're not fading right into the next hour. Don't, think that this is a rule i'm just letting everybody know i'm not going to promise this because usually we don't have three minutes before the top of the hour to uh to do a mic check there but we'll uh so tyler if you want to do a uh if you want to turn that camera on do a mic check otherwise we'll put you back <laughs> so so well, maybe maybe tyler didn't know what right raising the hand meant that you're going to end up in front of a couple hundred people no pressure okay we'll put him back <laughs> okay there's dario you raised the bat signal. I'm here. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, there we <laughs> Ooh, go. Yeah, sorry. Coming, coming in pretty hot. Uh, you might want to okay. turn, turn it down if you can. Sorry, gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, let's put Tyler back into the, into the, uh, into the, into the audience there. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. The, we had a great conversation getting started in, in, uh, in, in Sunday. I can't remember whether it was during the show or after the show, but it was, a, it was a fun conversation. And I thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be worth talking about. I happen to be, I mean, I've worked on concerts for the last 30 years. So behind the scenes, um, you know, putting them on virtual ones, everything else. And so I think about it a lot because, you know, I love, and I love going to concerts. I mean, or I did, I don't go to that many anymore. Um, but uh, I've tinnitus <laughs> takes a lot of the fun away. <laughs> so all, from all those concerts. Um, so, but I think that we're in a moment, just like with all virtual events that concerts are about to change, you know, they're about to evolve. And so, so I think that, uh, and Daria has been on the front end of, the reason I want to make sure Daria was here and before we got started is uh, Daria has been on the front end of virtual conferences, uh, probably ahead of almost everybody else. Oh, <laughs> thanks so, in large part, thanks to getting to collaborate with you, which has been amazing, but thank you. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so if you have questions about the future of concerts and how, how they might be virtual and so on and so forth, go ahead and throw them in. Daria, how did you get started doing virtual concerts? Um, it was purely necessity. Um, it was still coming in. Still coming oh, a little hot. hot. I don't know if you, oh, you, do you have a control. Okay. Yeah. That? Sorry. 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 Hey, check, check, no check, check, check. There we go. That's How's good. that? Good. Yeah, it's better. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Awesome. Anyway, um, ahead. okay. Yeah. So, I mean, as I've told my story, you know, my story, but, um, I'm just a singer songwriter in the woods in the middle of nowhere who was really wanting to play for people. And, um, when there there was the first sort of iteration of what we're in right now with Google Hangouts, um, I sort of saw that and thought maybe I could sing into this thing. And I was lucky enough to kind of be there at a moment. And I think we're having moments like that right now. It's really exciting. I feel like this is the first time since then that I feel like there's this massive revolution and boom with what's going on with social media. Everything's changing really fast. It's really exciting. But yeah, I opened my laptop and, and started singing for people and they popped in from all over the world. And we started doing something like this that was totally unlike anything that I had gotten to do in the real world in coffee shops or, or clubs where I could see people face to face. I could sing to you just like this. Um, I was singing all originals. People were suddenly knowing my songs. Um, and they were all over the world. And it was just a thrilling and really surprising thing to have happen. And I fell madly in love with this world and this kind of community and became sort of an honorary member of the tech nerd club and have been proudly tagging along ever since. That's great. And, and by the way, for the panelists, you can raise your hand to talk to because it's more of a round table discussion amongst all of us uh, with, you know, as we go through it, Let's, we'll go ahead and uh, jump into the questions as well um let's see here bill are you still absolutely we are first oh, there one. you moved you moved oh, from my, in my reference and i was like what happened to bill what, all right no yeah. i'm i'm still here yeah, yeah. um the first question comes from dave chalmers in glasgow scotland and it's he says hi folks i've joined the panel today so i can talk about our use of qpilot to build an automated orchestra live streaming system if folks are interested oh yeah oh yeah let's 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 yeah show okay. us what you got 
Yeah, thanks, guys. I can share some pictures if. Uh, Mickey, can you make him a co-host? And Dave, you're a bit quiet. I don't know if you have any. No worries. Up. I'll come up a little bit. So yeah, the way this started off for us, um, we we were interested in this software, QPilot. It's a system that was originally designed for a, replacing the cue cards when you're doing a big multi-camera production. All the camera operators have little uh, flip-over cards that have all their, their shots on it. And uh, QPilot produced the software that replaces that with an iPad. Um, but really it's grown arms and legs since then and uh, we worked with the developers who are based in Denmark uh, on um, adding in a PTZ camera control. So we've ended up with a system that looks a bit like this. Um, there is a, a Qpilot server um, which uh, controls a, a range of PTZ cameras using either Visca over IP or uh, the Panasonic protocol. Um, and those are going into a vision switcher. In our case, it's an ATEM 2ME switcher. Um, but QPilot is controlling the switcher as well, so all the shots are prepared on the timeline. Uh, the nice thing about classical music is generally folk don't improvise, so you've got the score, you know what they're going to play, so you know what your shots are going to be. So um, the director goes through and marks up the score, same as normal, they, they add uh, the shot number, the camera number, and then they pick a preset that they want to use, which might be in this case a mid shot of the conductor, or a three shot of the pickles or whatever. Um, and those sh then those shots are all pr programmed into the PTZ cameras. And in some cases, we might have 40, 50 shots programmed into PTZ. And if you've ever tried to recall that many shots uh, manually, it's hard work. Um, so the QPilot system does it for us. What, what we end up with, we can import this, the shot list as a CSV into QPilot. And we end up with a timeline with all the shots listed there. Um, and then they operate the, the director, rather than shouting out commands to the vision mixer, they just go next, next shot, next shot, next shot, and step through the, the, the timeline. Um, so we set up a PTZ camera, that's pretty normal stuff. Um, we also use an operated camera usually. We find that mixing the two gives us really nice results. Um, and uh, we have a couple of remote camera operators, but they are not recalling the shots. They're just finessing the shots. QPilot. It know, as soon as it's finished with a shot, because it's controlling the switcher and the PTZs, it knows when it's done with the camera and immediately recalls the next shot that's going to come up for that camera. So the operators can get, get right into that, they can check the focus, they can tweak the settings. So instead of spending the whole show mashing buttons to recall shots, they're just doing all the fun stuff and uh, tweaking the shots. The director is sitting at the QPilot system. This one's shown using a Stream Deck. Actually, there's a new uh, dedicated Scar Hodge panel that uh, QPilot have done. And they're just controlling the timing. So they've got a score reader who's calling out, OK, shot 25, shot 26. And they're just hitting next shot, next shot, next shot. So rather than all the mayhem that's going on normally in a, in a gallery, everything's much calmer. And we can do it with a lot less people as well. Um, this is a little video here. This, you'll let it run. Um, that shows the type. There's a little robotic voice that tells you what shot's coming next. And it just runs through. And the timing is controlled by the director. Um, but the, the, the recalling the shots and cutting up the shots on the Atom is all done by QPilot. That's really interesting. That's great. Um, yeah, and, and it it is, you know, you find that you are rehearsing a lot of things and you're trying to get for a lot of our stuff, we're trying to get the cameras to the same place at the same time, especially for some of the stuff that I've been working on recently, we're working with click tracks. And so the band is going to be at the same, you know, the same place at the same time. They may have a little break between songs, but outside, but even the ones we're doing there, all the breaks are calculated, everything else. And so, you know, we've been talking about getting things like uh, mechanized precision. I think it's called mechanized precision. Um, we, these are full on arms that we can, we can program the position and, you know, all the camera and everything else and just tie that all the time code. And, and then the cameras are exactly where we want them. And all the, the artists just have to hit the mark, you know, um, Jeff and then Mickey. I only saw one slide. Were we supposed to see multiple slides changing there? Uh, I think it was just that example. What, oh, sorry. Does Jeff just uh, get in touch on Discord afterwards? I can follow up on that. 
Sure. And, and my question for you is, is about uh, preparation programming time, the, the amount of legwork before the concert begins. Can you talk sure. through that well, a little bit? Yeah, of course. So the, the director has to mark up the score and get all the shots in. We load them up into Key Pilot. Then the orchestra rehearse prior to the performance. And by that time, we've, we've put in all the presets. We've already lined them all up. And we're just stepping through, checking all the checking the timeline. Um, so typically, we run on a three-day cycle. So a uh, day to set up, a day to rehearse, it, and then you're into the performance. Uh, Mickey? Yeah, I guess for the two like this, though, like um, it would it would depend on the artist, uh, the director, and I guess even the manpower. If like I know, I'm sure there's a lot of directors that want to be able to be sp spontaneous uh, with the, with the cutting. So sure, well like, you, how, you can. Do you have the you have the ability to overcut? So on the keypad for this for the key pilot, you've got all the cameras. You can just cut it manually, like you're cutting up a show on a on a vision switcher. And you can you can cut up man you can overcut a shot jump to somewhere else in the timeline and then restart again. Great. Um, next question. Uh, JJ, oh, go I'm sorry, oh. Mike. I missed Michael. Go ahead. Oh, sure. No, I just was curious. Is there something akin to a pause function or something like that so that you can actually you know stop your cue list for a minute? Yeah. Go in to the, in, your, in the your example, improv and then yeah. Of okay. course, yeah. So the example Alex gave, where you're running to time code, it it is runs. And the mode we use it with the orchestra is step mode. So you're controlling the timing. You're controlling when the next shot's going to cut up. So you can wait as long as you like, and then you take the shot when you want. Next question. Okay. Uh, JJ McKenna's in from Santa Venetia, and he asks, will concerts need interactivity, such as Daria explained in her TED Talk? Yes, please. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think Alex and I always say like why are you doing it live if there's no interaction like what is what is the point of that um yeah as you know from from my TED talks and other ramblings everywhere um I'm obsessed with the interaction that we can have on the internet and how magical that can be and I think the more um people putting on concerts people organizing where where their live stream concerts are going and artists start to embrace that the more fun you have and the, the more exciting it can be and there's some interesting examples you know like um I actually I'm always obsessed with this topic but I read up even on like the latest stuff that's going on so if you guys want me to tell you you know it's interesting I feel like right now there's as always kind of in the music industry a great divide between like the super super superstar talent um who are on major labels and have millions and millions of dollars behind them and then people who are doing their own thing like more on the youtuber -y kind of side like where i am and uh so those of us who are kind of one man setups uh, i think we're always sort of interested in interaction and we're always trying to push our own boundary of how do we connect and how do we organize that and make that fun and exciting. Um, there's some really cool stuff going on with the, the look and the opportunity on the bigger end with things like Wave VR, where people are doing like fully virtualized avatars playing in, you know, scapes of like space alien worlds and stuff, which is really cool. They're interactively, I think right now at the level of like vote for the next song or something, which is something, it's cool. Um, or we're gonna put your faces up, kind of like Alex, uh, do you see that all the time? I'm like, they're doing what we did. Um, <laughs> where they put um, the fans and their videos up behind the screen, but I don't think anyone's as brave as or crazy as we were doing it live I think a lot of that is pre-taped so that they know mm -hmm. there's no stress but yeah um it's a great conversation I'd love to talk to you guys about this topic more and see what you guys think but I definitely have lots of thoughts go ahead Brian uh you know I I think it was a post show where where this discussion was going on with Jan and you and that's why I'm here today um but what about the artists who are total introverts, uh, outsiders who, uh, I don't know, a Bob Dylan, he's not going to have like every, you know, a lot of people like Bob Dylan, but how are they, how is he, how is somebody like him or somebody like him of the future going to be a part of this world? They don't want audience interaction. They don't want to interact with anyone. You know, how, how do they make, how do they make a streaming event work for them? I don't, you know, it, there's some people that can, that will be good enough that you, you, you simply want to, to watch it. But I do think that with every evolution of any art, 
there are people who you, you can just say, well, that person, it's not going to be available for everyone. And it's not like, I can't, I, I never had the bill to be a gymnast. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I, I could do gymnastics, but I can't, I'm not going to ever compete. And so in the same sense that, that, um, you know, there, uh, there people have natural proclivities that are going to make them better for some certain generation of, of music where they, they're, they have to, I mean, bands for bands. And this has been, I think since the beginning, uh, right place, right time, right set, you know, right personality, right. All those things have been an issue forever where there's just bands that don't fit into whatever that model is. Um, you know, when I, you know, I, I saw, I was a music director and worked at Sony during the first worked at Sony, then a music director uh, during the early nineties. And suddenly there was this huge force that came out of Seattle. <laughs> if you weren't from Seattle, it was really hard to get a meeting. And, and, um, and then it was, and then it moved on, you know, and, um, and so there's, so I think that, you know, I've, I've had friends that are in bands that were just the wrong place. I mean, they're incredible. I mean, what I'm always amazed by is how many incredible music artists are out there that are still, you know, playing for 50 people when they, they deserve to be, be playing in front of a lot of people. And I think that in some ways virtual is going to give them that opportunity because they can aggregate people all over the world that are interested in what they're doing. I, I, I went to a, I have to admit, I went to a flamenco guitar or a flamenco performance um, in my city hall in Novato, California. Like it's this tiny little hall. There's maybe a hundred people in it. And I, my, I went because, you know, my wife told me to go. So, so anyway, so I, you know, I like, <laughs> like that's, that's the number one reason you do anything. And um, anyway, so, uh, so I, I went and um, was just stunned by the, by the quality. I mean, of the dancers, of the, of the, of the instrumentalists, it's all amazing. And I was like, I cannot, I, I know that these people are just, they're getting paid a little bit of money to do this. They love, they love their art and they are truly stunning. And, and I've been thinking about it ever since of like, how do I persuade the city hall to let me put big cameras in there and just do a streaming thing so that thousands of people can, can enjoy their music at one time, because that allows them to multiply. So for every person, I think that you have that can't make this work. I think that there's another person that suddenly is given an opportunity that didn't have before, you know, is to aggregate across, you know, not being uh, constrained by geographic, you know, um, limitations. Go ahead, Brian, and then we'll go to Chris. Yeah. And, and do you think that uh, platforms, and I mean, I've, I've seen some of these job postings on LinkedIn and other places, but like Spotify looking for more people in the video world. So are they going to, are you going to discover bands and music that way? through platforms if like Spotify, Spotify. Smart. if they're smart yeah. they will yeah you know what I mean Those like they're, the, they're gonna they're yeah. gonna build they're gonna build a pipeline for it and yeah. and I think that the the challenge w that we've had working with bands is mostly that playing a long concert also live has a problem which is that you can only play those songs so many times before no one wants to hear you play them live again like I mean not no one but you're there's diminishing returns um on playing the same show over and over again you have that when you tour because they only saw it in that arena or that bar but you know you can't do it online the same way they're not going to keep coming every night to do that one of the things that again we've been experimenting with is a format with daria with brian vander ark with peter hillman which we're going to do a lot more of this year is the idea that just play one or two songs you know and talk you know because we get to know you that's the, that's what makes it special is you know discussing your thought process discussing what it is interacting with people answering questions and not spilling out your entire album or a whole bunch of albums you, you know just figure out two songs you're going to crush and you're going to play those ones that's what you're getting and and the thing is is i i really found that i enjoyed the the, the time we spent with uh daria and peter and and brian to be as meaningful and as impactful as watching them just play um without any interaction so I, I don't think that artists have to fill the whole time up with music. We want to know what's behind the song. We want to know what, you know, what the story was, you know, that that's something that we can't get listening to it on Spotify. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. I'm wondering, this is partly a question for Daria, but I also need to go back and look at her Ted talk too. Um, the level of interaction, you know, the, the, the opera company that I've been working with for the past six months, we had a program in the winter time uh, where it was on Vimeo and it was streaming. So it was a high quality stream. And the only interaction was via the, the messaging or the text or whatever those, you know, that little window is. And then we just had a program a few weeks ago where I had done a music video for them and it was part of a much bigger program, but that director insisted on doing it on zoom for the, for the face to face 
gallery interaction that she she needed she felt she needed for her the show but because they don't have the high tech like we do they all the caveats happened you know even the music video that i made for them they played it back probably a screen share where it was going back at like five to ten frames per second other people were distorting when they were singing live some people had their microphone set up wrong and all of it was probably at 360p you know and i'm going to do my best to try to like give them some information or try to help them find between money and technical difficulty, find the most streamlined version of finding the place between those two things. Um, thing, when we go yeah. from physical to, to, to virtual, I, I will say the thing that we just see over and over again is underinvestment. You know, they understand yeah. what a staff is required and what's required to do it in a, in a hall, you know, like it, there's people and there's engineers and there's things, and then they want to do it for nothing on zoom and it doesn't turn out with re like we find over and over and over again with rehearsal, with preparation, with possibly kits sent to everyone that's going to be involved mm -hmm. that are not more of an, a higher investment than what they did on in a for a venue. Um, they end up getting a very high quality event, um, but they have to take that money that they were spending at the venue and spend it on the virtual event. They right. can't. And it's, and it's got to be at least 50 to 75 percent of what they were spending before. Um, to get to that level of, you know, being worth watching. Go ahead, Bill, and then Michael. Well, I'm just reminded, uh, because of the comment about Bob Dylan type artists, uh, what happened with American Island Alejandro Amanda Aranda uh, a couple of years ago, he is a relatively quiet, not bombastic, not big artist. And yet the intimacy of TV revealed his art in a way that I think was really exceptional. And it was brilliant to watch him develop and become a national presence without that, which just means that all of us who work in the tech behind the scenes, picking camera shots and doing the rest of that, you really can make a difference if you pay attention to who it is you're trying to, to bring out to the world because even if you're that kind of quiet, small, deeply internal performer, you can be magnified to the point where people can really love what you do. Good, Michael. I'm curious, Alex, how you think about this. There's going to be artists that having the interaction, having the feedback of, I, I don't know, monitors, you know, from uh, people at other shows, you know, that kind of stuff. Plus, you know, if there's going to be questions, all of that is going to be hugely distracting. Some people just, you know, like we were talking about Dylan, he's not, he's not going to cope with that. He's not going to work with it. There's going to be some people that are going to struggle with that though. How, you know, that, that are there's, willing to try. Right. But how do we, how do we mitigate Andy, too much distraction? I, I, and I'll let Daria answer this because she's probably better off, but I'll, all I'll say is that Andy Partridge can't play in, in public from XTC and that's why they don't tour. So there's, there's the problem that, you know, my goal is to figure out a way that we can get XCC to play for us, mostly as a challenge because, because they, you know, he doesn't have to go in front of a bunch of people and he doesn't have to see people and he can maybe just some, have someone talking to him. And I don't know if that's possible or not, but we'll, but that's like a, my stretch goal in this area. But the point is, is that there's a lot of bands that can't tour because they don't want to interact with human beings, you know? And so they, you know, they, and they, they don't go out, you know, they, they play in their, in their studios and they, and so, so for them, there may be a different, you know, again, I, I, we, you look at it, it's, there may be people who are just left behind, you know, like, like you just have to under, like in that area that it, it may not be, if they can't figure, if they can't figure out what the new platform is, they may just not make it. And that happens with every disruption. People get left behind, but, you know? And so the thing is, is that they, they need to evolve. Um, you know, we're building things where we have big LED walls and stuff that on the other side of the cameras, no crowd, big LED walls um, on the other side of the camera with tons of zoom windows that they can go look at their, if they want to look at folks, they can look at all these folks that are interacting and dancing and waving and, and they can have some kind of feedback because bands want it. But we're working with I worked with tons of bands that it doesn't matter to them. Like they will, they will go out on stage and they'll play exactly the same way that they did with and without the audience. And those are because they're, they're technicians. I mean, they, I mean, not, I mean, they're artists, but they're also, they know how to put on a performance and they don't need anybody in the room to do it. Um, and that's, yeah, and, and that's a level of skill that I think is higher than, than people just being able to respond. Well, part, part of it for my artist, you know, he, he sits behind a piano. He doesn't move. He doesn't get up and walk around. That makes it easier. Kind of can't. Well, okay, but there's there's twelve people on stage, including him. Mm -hmm. And how how do you put up monitors? I mean, 
part of my thought was, you know, there's a band leader and there's uh, Matt who stands next to him. Those two can interact pretty well. Um, but, you know, how do I get Brian involved in that? without having big monitors that are in the shot that are, that are, you know, blocking well, you the rest of the stage, you know, and again, I don't know if you, you know, again, it, it, it's, it can be a teleprompter or something very small, but just has it right, right around the camera. It doesn't have to be massive, massive things that are there. And he doesn't. And, and the question is, does he need to see people or not, you know, or can he just look at the camera and know that that's your audience? Cause Daria is a better person to answer this. Cause this is her, her, <laughs> not, her field. not better, but um, I think, so Michael, this is, this is a really interesting topic because I think that if you look at it not as a, a stressor I, I feel like you're stressing like you we can look at it as a creative opportunity and I think that what we're talking about here like I loved Bill's reference I love that artist scary, scary pool party is amazing um from from American Idol um there are so many different kinds of artists and I think if we if you lean into what naturally works for someone you can come up with creative solutions that are all of a sudden unique and not what everybody else is doing. And like, that's, that's what happened to me. Like I, I'm an extrovert, if you can't tell. <laughs> so I was like shriveling with no interaction. And when I was playing in clubs and there were four people or whether there were a hundred people, but when they weren't looking at me or whatever, I was like, what do I do? You know? So seeing people filled me with, with joy and with a sense of the world that I was singing for. And so that worked for me. But if I were the friend of this artist that you're talking about, or another artist who might be more introverted or shy or, or worried about the way things are changing, I would say, well, how can we make this cool? How can we, let's build the mystery of it. You know, let's like, you could build out a set to do a live stream that is really, really mysterious and have all the interaction be like something that happens before and after with, you know, picking the set list or something simple, like what, what other people are doing right now. Um, I've actually been thinking recently about wanting to start a new show where maybe I would host and have other artists and friends come on because I think if there's safety in numbers, you know, when artists get together, um, a, an artist who's a little more shy could, you know, piggyback with someone like me and I could handle the interaction a little bit and then let them play. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say before we move on, I think the other cool thing about playing online is that it opens the opportunity to look at like different categories of performances and live streams and then decide if you want to blend those categories or stick to one. But there's entertainment, there's kind of edutainment. Um, and then there's a sort of behind the scenes, like hanging out converse, conversation and stuff. And I think um, there's people doing all of those different versions really well. There's just like stand and deliver as if you were on a stage doing an awesome performance and killing it and good night. Thank you so much. There's people that I absolutely adore, like... Um, uh, like Jacob Collier. Jacob Collier has a new thing with his Patreon where I think it's like for $5 a month or something. He has a Zoom that isn't broadcast anywhere. You just have to be in it and hundreds and hundreds of people go in and he does kind of like, Alex, what I, what I would do except it's less of a performance and more like you're in Jacob's studio with him and you can ask him nerdy music questions and there's no pressure of a larger audience watching so he doesn't have to entertain the whole time. He can answer a really deep dive about the cycle of fifths and then play an example and then move on to the next question so that's kind of an edutainment example and then the example that I really love that Alex was saying also is song talk hang out you're kind of in the studio with me chilling it's a little more on the entertainment side a little little less education but a lot of hanging out and a lot of talking about process and um personally for me I think that's always really exciting and really thrilling if if that works for you I found I found we did these streams with Pomplamoose of them in the studio I've talked about in the past where they're just figuring out a song. They're doing a cover and they're going to figure it out while you're watching. And I found that to be more interesting to watch than most concerts was just totally. watching the, the thought process, them experimenting, them working with their session part, you know, the session uh, artists that came in um, and, OK, let's do this. Well, what about this kind of groove? And let's do this thing here. And it was so fascinating to watch them kind of uh, come up with that art. Um, I think that that's the part that I think a lot of artists, including me, uh, oftentimes don't want to show. Uh, you don't want to show your work and and you have a tendency, but there's that, you know, not showing your work or not having people involved in that process is kind of like, you know, raising a cow and only using the hide. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, I, you know, I, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot more there to, to, to use. Go ahead, Chris, and then Jan. Yeah, Daria, what, what platform are you using again? Are you using a platform where you like Zoom, where you see their, your audience and then also 
question number two, if you do bring other artists in, are you going to take some kind of, not responsibility, but are you going to help them get their audiovisual kind of up to on par with kind of where yours is, or are you not going to bother with that? Yeah. So Chris, um, I'd actually love, we should talk in the discord and talk about it. And I'm, I'm always ready to bug Alex about all these new ideas that I have too, and putting these kinds of new shows on. Um, I started out in Google Hangouts, uh, which was like a proto zoom. And yeah, so now zoom is the best, I think, um, sort of equivalent to that. Um, and then I've been trying everything lately. I think my big pet peeve with what's going on with live concerts right now is that there's not one really obvious answer for musicians. Everything is crunched and shaped into a different thing. I've been doing a song a day on Instagram live, which has been a really exciting just practice of daily practice for me and a daily interaction with people, which has been fun. And kind of like Alex was saying, you crunch it down to one song so you don't run out. Um, but yeah, we should talk about that because that, yeah, let's offline about it. But yeah, if I was going to do that show, I would definitely want to do what Alex does with this show, get people ready, make sure their audio sounds good. Got to keep the quality up for sure. We prep most people that are coming onto this show even, you know, I have a meeting with them and talk through what's going to happen and look at their, look at what they're doing. And for most of our shows, we spend a lot of time. I'm right now I'm designing, I don't have the money to buy it yet, but I'm designing a kit that we're going to start sending out when we start really doing these artist pieces that we can remote control. So it basically um, ties in to it's, it'll, it'll tie into our VPN. So literally someone like Brian or, or Mickey or someone can literally log in and just take over the, the mixer um, and feed all of that stuff back eventually over Unity Connect <laughs> so that we can um, uh, bring in all the stems, you know, back and do a bunch of interesting things with them. And so, but the idea is to send out a, a whole pre-built kit to the artists um, that hopefully they'll send back. It'll be expensive. That's awesome. Um, uh, but, but yeah, so I think that that is, a because I, I just know that'll be a big piece of that puzzle. Go ahead, Jam. Right now, the concert industry is in, in complete turmoil with COVID. One of the things people want to get out there and tour, but they're afraid if they get out on the road. And then let's just say the opening act comes up with uh, come, comes up with COVID. One, just one guy. That What happens then when they do that? So people are moving into streaming. A lot of the companies that I work with right now, they're all building streaming rooms. The biggest companies of our uh, of the who normally supply concert touring equipment they're all building streaming rooms but my question is is this is audience because we have to find our own audience and and we could love to do music you could just stand in front of a camera play some guitar and then you're streaming out to wherever you want spotify youtube instagram tiktok but my question is how many billy eilishes are there I mean, where do you get to the point where, how do you market? And I think that's more important because survival is the number one thing. You, you, you could be the greatest artist in the world, but if you can't afford to put food on your table, then you have to do other things. So the question is, is how does a new artist, forget about Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan's fine. Bruce Springsteen's fine. You know, it's the new artist like Daria She's the one who's got to figure out how to make a living out of this without going in front of people. And so well, one last thing I want to say is this, is that Foreigner was doing a tour and it kept canceled, but they had bought all this merchandise. And now they're auctioning off this merchandise and giving the money to their crews. So whatever they sell for the Foreigner gear, they're going to give it to the crews. So merchandising is one of those things. But, but that's the question. How do you find your audience? How do you market to that audience? Well, it, the, the only thing I'll say, and then Daria can, can say something to it as well, is that I strongly believe, and I believe for a long time, that, that content is not king, community is king. Content is just the honeypot. So using the music that you're doing, using the content that you're doing to build a community, if you're not thinking as an artist around building a community around your art, um, you're going to have, it's just going to get, hard. It's, it's always hard. And it's almost always easy for, for, for folks who have built around their um, you know, there's a lot of folks, a lot of these larger bands that have built large fan bases, um, you know, to, you know, and those fan bases, they could convert anytime they wanted to money, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's, and, you know, like they, you know, they, they, uh, cause there's a lot of people that are intense, but that took an enormous amount of effort. If you look at the effort that a Taylor Swift or, a, you know, put, puts into their fan base, I mean, I've had firsthand knowledge of that and they, 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 they have a whole crew that is just managing their fan base. You know, and that makes everything easier, you know, and so bands who just want to play their music and not interact with anyone, 
it's going to become increasingly difficult for them to survive. Um, they have to figure it out. And the, the hard part is, is that there's no quick fix. There was no quick fix to create what we created here. You know, that this is, you know, there's, there's just a lot of interaction and repeating it and doing it and working with others and collaborating and, you know, those types of things. Go ahead, Daria. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, if it was really, if it was easy and uh, clear to understand how to do it, everybody would do it. And this is something that I've been uh, obsessed with since I started, <laughs> since I started singing. And Jan, uh, all I can say is that I think that there's a lot of good minds on this right now. And it's driven people like me to actually, I'm making my first, you know, sort of baby steps into the venture world, because I've been designing like we need to make this easier. There needs to be a ladder for people to understand how to get and build this community that Alex is right is, is totally king. But right now, you know, like sort of in the reference to TED Talk that I did, I call it being an artistpreneur. I think artists have to think of themselves as little mini businesses, little mini startups. You're the entrepreneur, you're the product, you're the talent, you're the marketing, you're, you're the outreach, you're everything. And if you can take what you love to do and get creative, just like you are with your songs, just like you are with your concerts, start to think of that as a creative problem to solve and get yourself excited about it. There are really unique and exciting answers to all of that. And I can give examples of artists like myself who, who have built cool careers now that are, I, I like to say like, you wanna rip a U-shaped hole in the universe that only you can fill, you know? <laughs> Cause then you're sort of not in competition with anybody else. And so like a Jacob Collier is a really good example. Um, and there's a lot of really cool artists who are doing it in their own way. But also to piggyback off what we were saying earlier about using the behind the scenes or what you're loving to make, I call it like using the cookie scraps, you know, like when you're making cookies that you punch out, um, the, the scraps taste just as good as the cookie, but sometimes you end up throwing those out. So you want to you wanna use all the cookie scraps. So like making the song, doing all that stuff, um, it can all be useful. And there's lots of opportunity to make money once you start building that community and there, and there really is and right now i think that for the small band uh, the leaders are is patreon i mean you just see these incredible like you know right now i mean we've worked with a bunch of those bands and they're making they're making a, a, a living at least uh yeah, you know doing what yeah. they're doing on there i mean we're, you know they're are they making millions no but are they making 20 or thirty thousand dollars a month yes you know and, and so a lot of them and so it is you know and i think that as we do this i do think that we're going to see less I think we're going to see less mega stars and more stars, you know, like, like folks that, you know, I think yeah. you will see a handful of mega stars. I think but you're going to see a lot more people making, you know, a living able to pay their bills, able to pay their mortgage, pay the, pay that, you know, and, and so there's going to be a lot more people that have an opportunity to, to be an artist and have that be their profession instead of, you know, in LA, you know, how many people are, are, you know, serving tables that will never turn the corner. You know, and, you know, we'll never, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be serving tables forever thinking that someday they, they're going to be an actor or someday they're going to be a musician or someday they're going to do this. Whereas, you know, in this case, you could get to a point where you could be playing and making, again, 50, 100, 200, 300, 500 thousand dollars a year, not 40 million, you know, and I'm actually more excited about that possibility of more people getting to be artists than less making being megastars, you know, Me and too. I think that what we're yeah, and I think that that's where we're going. Yeah, um, a new artist middle class. Like how yeah. how unbelievably cool would that be? Yep, yep. Uh, Bill, and then Jim. and we don't have to look to the future to figure this out because I think back in the '60s, the Grateful Dead pretty figured this out. I mean, if you were just had the Deadheads in your world and brought that into the 20th century and built that through social media, well, you would never be out of that, work for your whole life. And that band is called Fish. <laughs> like oh you never you never see fish you never hear them. like you don't you don't see anything about fish except they're making a super solid living i mean you know uh and they're just doing private concerts all the time i mean they they, they have dialed that thing all the way in uh to the you know to, to doing that and they've been doing that for a decade or more than a decade two decades uh go ahead jan and then and then uh, i'd like you Michael. to expand on that community aspect of it because mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what your thought process is, because I think it all comes from the creativity of, of the songwriting rather than the playing or the performing. Because for example, do you think of an artist that would just do cover songs would ever get any exposure or grow to a point where don't you believe it becomes from the content? 
And the other thing I will say is that anybody who gets into the business with the aspect of it, it's only about the money. We'll never make any not, money because it can't be about the money. It's it not, has to it's be not, about the art. It's not about it, but it is about making a living doing what you love to do. So I don't think that it's a matter of, you know, uh, it's a, you, you know, I, I don't, I don't do what I do because I, I want to make more money. I do it because I love to build what I'm building and I love to work on the projects that I'm working on, but I do need to charge for it or it won't get, you know, and so the thing is, or I won't get to keep doing it. And so there's a, there's a level of sustainability. I think that's important. Um, as far as uh, someone <laughs> to go back to Pomplamus, as far as like how a cover, you know, Pomplamus is now doing their own original songs but they built up 5 million people watch, you know, or, or, you know, four or 5 million people watching them only do covers. Now they did extremely imaginative covers, really well done covers, um, really good music videos for those covers. But their first, I don't know, five or six years was mostly the vast majority of his covers and they still do tons of covers, you know? And so, um, but what makes it work is that, you know, uh, Jack is incredibly talented and so is Natalie and they both are very good at playing, very good at singing. And they have a great community around them of, of, of artists that play with them and and but a, a large chunk of what they're doing is really really creative takes on covers so i don't think that 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 you can't do that um and i think that but they do a lot of it you know they're doing you know four a week four a month one every week i think is comes you know that they still produce um to do that it's just a, it, anything that you're doing well can build up a community especially if you interact with that community but it does take repetition uh, michael and then bill my question is how are you monetizing this? I mean, are you, you, do you see it as a subscription or do you see it, you know, uh, maybe as live paid events somehow? Because now if you're doing that, now you're tempted to involve like a ticket master or something that, uh, you know, has an outlet that's bigger than that. I mean, for example, I, I was just thinking, you know, this with my artist, how, how could I present this in a form that says hey you know we could stand a chance to make uh, a little bit of money you know return on investment here how do, how do we do that well with anything i think that you can the roi is highest i mean the, you, if you put it get in early we've talked about this before but i strongly believe that free is the straw that drank a thousand milkshakes you know and so getting out there and getting in front of it and building up that audience before you start trying to do anything else is um you know is important you know, and to build that relationship and to build that, those things out. Um, the, you want to make it, to, if you don't have that community, I think you need to, there's going to be some nug work to get that, build up that community. And that's not, you can't just ask people to pay for something they haven't seen before, for the most part. Um, um, I do think that there's a lot of platforms coming because <laughs> I've been involved in them. There are a lot of platforms coming to do pay-per-view video, you know, stuff. Um, also sponsorship. So, you know, you find uh, brands that want to be connected to that artist. Uh, but if you're already a big artist, you can do that relatively easily, actually. If you are not a big artist, you have to, um, you have to build up that community, you know. And I've definitely worked. I mean, the number one thing that I see between artists that are successful and, and the ones that aren't are the ones that can build up community today are the ones that can build community and the ones that can't. You know, that they, they don't want to interact. They don't want to have conversations. They don't want to whatever. And they are some of the most talented music musicians I've ever seen. And nobody knows about them. And they're not doing that for their business. They're out driving Uber and working, you know, somewhere else, maybe in the industry, but not doing what they love to do because they don't want to interact with people. And that's the, and that hasn't been just for this. It's just, it's just been the case. Let's jump to the questions real quick. Cause we're, we're going to run out of time and we've been talking. Go ahead. Okay, Jeff Francis is in with, over the past years, what virtual concerts have you enjoyed and which have not worked? Go ahead, Bill. The first one that really surprised me, and I only know about it because my niece was involved in San Francisco, uh, was hardly strictly bluegrass. I, I, I was surprised at, I expected another trash heap because there's so many of these virtual live events and we're going to virtualize something we did before. But I thought the way they waved storytelling, recorded performances, some live performances, uh, now, they were incredibly fortunate because they're funded amazingly because there was a venture capitalist who made that part of his will that he wanted to support it. So they had the resources necessary to come in at a high level. But I thought it really worked for that. And I found seven new artists that I didn't know about that really spoke to me through that format. 
I haven't found any that I watch unless there's interactivity. Like unless I'm seeing a band and we're talking, I mean, the, the, my favorite one, my favorite ones have been the ones we did here, you know, like the, the quality, I kind of backed away for a little bit because I wanted to get 1080p and I wanted to figure it out. Um, but I think the video quality is the only part and the audio quality is the only part that I found challenging, but I actually preferred those over everything else so far. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, we were lucky enough to have our good friend here, Victor, come in for our holiday party, our company holiday party. We, oh, we hired him and it was so cool just to have him bring that spirit. And it was just something so unique that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So I thought that was a success, even though it was a small, small thing, but yep. to him, it meant the world. And he spent the time to, you know, dial in everything and we had 1080p. And so it looked beautiful, sounded great because he had the fidelity sound. So for those that take the time to spec it out and and practice and rehearse like Victor does. It's it's amazing yeah. on the other side. We're watching Victor slowly put this, you know, battle station together. <laughs> like as he as he does it, you know, every show, everything, he just keeps on adding adding bits and pieces to it. It's it's kind of fun. It's a really fun thing to watch. Um, next question, JJ McKenna, uh, back up with how did the remotes band start creating input to start creating music together? We're gonna bump that to tomorrow since the remotes are gonna be here tomorrow. So uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll bump that question tomorrow. Uh, next question, Ken Richer uh, says, how do organizations deal with the myriad of copyright implications of the online music streaming world? So you can get around a lot of that by private, you know, private labeled streaming. You know, so you're not, you know, you can't stream to YouTube or Facebook or pro you know nowadays even TikTok or other things without being clipped for it. Um, so if you're going to do covers, I mean, obviously you got to be careful legally uh, on it, but the biggest thing that you have to worry about is, is doing, um, uh, is the automated systems knocking you out. Um, most people aren't going to really come after you if, until you get big, <laughs> then they'll really come after you. Um, but they're not going to come after every, most artists won't come after every little artist unless they're like the Eagles or Metallica. Although the Metallica got, I don't know if we saw, if anyone saw what happened to Metallica, but their own concert on Twitch got clipped. I just thought, they got a copyright takedown for their own songs. They didn't. It didn't copyright. It, it does this automated thing, but replaced it with other music. It, it replaced it with the <laughs> like. <laughs> it was. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the guys are very talented, but they have spent their a lot a large portion of their career attacking people using their music for copy. You know the copyright. So the so to get to get that in return was kind of funny. I'm sorry. And it defines it hoist on your own petard. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. And there's a great Twitter thread where they uh, rewrote Enter Sandman lyrics with uh, Minecraft <laughs> based off of that. It yeah. just goes on and on and on. So yeah. go dive yeah. and look for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so so the um, uh, I think that you do have to be careful with it. Um, again, what we do a lot is we play the songs into an unlisted event, if we're going to do it on YouTube, in, into an unlisted event from the account that we're going to use. And we just see, are they going to track it, demonetize it? or block or or spike it and 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 once you know you can if they're just going to demonetize it a lot of times you just go ahead and do it you know like like it's not you know they're not they're obviously not being belligerent about it and um and then they just don't want you to make money on it so that's the other it's 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 actually a pretty easy way to figure out what songs are what um, and then we just take the songs out that have it and, and then you're done next question TJ Asher in Minneapolis and the panel here says, I've watched a few online concerts the last couple of months with huge stage productions from huge stage productions to smaller venues. Most have been just like watching a concert movie and could have been pre-recorded. How can a group with a large stage production make the experience more live feeling? Interact with the audience. If you don't interact with the audience, I don't know how you do that. Like, I don't know how you... Unless you, I don't understand, like to me, there's breaking news, sports or live interaction. Those are the three reasons that you go live. Um, if you don't do one of those, why not just record it and publish it? Like, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't, it doesn't compute. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, one of the bands that I follow who are pretty interactive um, on Instagram, on Twitch, um, they're actually on three different continents, the members of the band. And so they came together, albeit without their drummer who couldn't come across. So they got a substitute drummer and filmed a incredibly high quality production uh, that had a storyline to it, but it was not interactive. It was released as a concert video and it was intended to be that way. So they kept their interaction elsewhere and had one really good, well-produced concert video event. And, and, and that one worked of the, successfully for them. 
one of the things we have when I say interactive, it doesn't necessarily have to be interactive with the band. It just has to have people be able to talk while they're watching or, or interact or do whatever they want to do. The shared experience of watching the, the a live feed is is valuable. So the band could literally post a video and then be interacting with the audience in the in the chat. You know, like, you know, so there could be a lot of back and forth between the band and the and the audience about the about the songs and everything else. Um, they could still have their kind of clean record that they want to do, but then also um, have that interaction. So it's just it's just some sort of interaction is the thing that's important. Go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, an old trick of bands and performers used to be to bring an audience member up and then perform for them or make it personal to them. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you think that might work in this because you know you, we're virtually then feeling that we're that audience member up there. I think it can. I think it, I think it's the harder route, you know, to do that. Um, you know, so I think that that's, that's the challenge, uh, is, is that bringing, as soon as you put somebody else in the room, the band's not really paying attention to the online audience anymore, you know, or very much. Um, so I think that, I do think that it would be fun to have bands bring, <laughs> I'm making this up as I talk, so I, I, we'll see how it comes out, but having bands invite fans, uh, to play with them would be pretty fun. You know, that would be a fun take, you know, like what Foo Fighters does live, you know, get like, hey, we're going to have someone come, you know, we're going to have someone come on, we'll have Kiss Guy come on, or we'll have somebody else. like if you're a fan, and you like send you could like, as a, as a community building project, a band could, for instance, do, you know, play the guitar for one of our songs, and we'll, we'll, we'll do it live with you. We'll, we'll bring you to wherever we are, and we'll be socially distanced or whatever, but you, we'll let you play guitar on enter the Sandman or enter or play it with with us. And we cut to you and do it, you would have so many people, like if it was Foo Fighters or something like that, they would have thousands of entries and then you have your whole audience voting on who the who the best uh, guitarist is like who should be playing with Foo Fighters for three months you have a whole bunch of people a whole bunch of fans just swirling around this conversation and then and then you get to see them and maybe you replace the whole thing like it's Dave Grohl and a, a you know a drum player and a guitar player and a bass player that all found their way up to do that or you mix and match it or, or whatever and they but then you have like you're generating all the videos you know so you have the videos of them playing the drum player like learning some of the way that the drum player from Foo Fighters plays and they they talk about it and they they you know they they work through it I don't know I, I would for me I would rather watch those videos of that kind of the the kid from Iowa getting to play with their with their favorite band or playing those songs than I would watching just a, another concert go ahead Dave and then uh Daria and then Roscoe. Yeah, this one example I was thinking of. We did a New Year's show where we had live bands in the studio, but there was no audience in the in, in the studio, of course. Mm -hmm. But we had a couple of Zoom room Zoom room meetings up on big screens, and the bands mm -hmm. could see them. And what we found was actually for a very small amount of interaction, the, the main interaction was between audience members. They were having a great time yep. between each yep. other as well. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, Daria. Yeah, I was going to say it's similar to that, the easier way to do that too. It still takes some legwork behind the scenes. Um, I used to have, like Alex helped me with this, but if you pick people to virtually pull up um, right. into the show and then you're singing for them, I've found that the empathy of that moment, that connection really scales mm -hmm. also because everybody feels like it could have been them. And right. if you are an artist who enjoys that face-to-face -face interaction, it's it's a really moving, like it can be a really exciting thing to feel like a medicine man, like doling out songs for different people, hearing a little bit about where they are, what's going on with them, pick the right song to sing to that person. It can mm -hmm. be a really magical moment. Um, yeah, so that's another way to do it. I, I, I love that idea. I mean, now, now that now I'm coming around, Roscoe's got, Roscoe and you and, and, and Dave have got me thinking about it. it but the virtual one makes I'm much more interested in the people in the physical one where people are requesting songs. And when we pick the song that yeah. they're going to play, you pull them up full. Like, I'm going to play it for totally. you're the one that requested the song. I'm going to play this song for you and everyone else gets to watch. That'd be a really fun, right? fun, fun thing to do. Go ahead, Roscoe. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually putting a link in right now. This happened uh, in uh, the Far East um, that they pulled a kid, a 16 year old bassist into a band and it went viral. And it was an yeah. incredible experience. And he was actually very talented, too. I'll put right. it. That's great. Um, next question. Uh, Peter Moore, occasional panelist here from Auckland, New Zealand, says, Daria Musk, I think uh, you being on G uh, Google Plus as the Google artist inspired more people than you know. What did you do after Google Plus uh, is demise in the early months? Um, sorry, what was the? After oh, Google oh, Plus yeah, is demise, yeah, yeah. what did you do? 
I know. Yeah. <laughs> I cried a lot. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually, I kind of went back into the studio. Um, I started making films. I sort of came back to my own artistry to like figure out what I wanted to do as my next move. And i um, very excited to kind of be reemerging from the cocoon now doing lots of live stuff and um, coming out with I have like shows and videos and films and all sorts of stuff coming out soon. I also started my own production company, um, Unlabeled Studio. So yeah, you can check that out. <laughs> That's awesome. Next question. Nick Gutfriend of Bedford, New York says, uh, Alex, have you seen or been involved with the Try Live events? A claim was made that synchronous live video audiences would be coming soon. Well, I think that, I mean, I think that the thing, I haven't been involved in those, um, but the thing that I think is interesting to think about is the fact that if you once you have more than a five or six hundred people, everyone's looking at the screen anyway. They're not looking at the stage, and the opportunity is there to put. You know, you could do concerts for many arenas, many theaters, many, and and you got to figure out what the experience is for the user when they get there. Uh, you know, they could be dancing to it. They could be, you know, but because a lot, a big chunk of going to a concert is finding your tribe, right? You know, so it's 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 going to see the people that are all interested in Metallica or all interested in orchestra or all interested in the police or whatever it is. It's it, the band is the, the, the epicenter of that, but it, it is finding those people and being able to aggregate all over the world to see those concerts together and finding ways to socially connect them online to each other, even though they're physically connected somewhere else, they want to be in the same space as other people, but you know, maybe, that becomes more viable for them um, as it as it goes down the path where bands can be playing for millions and millions of people all at physical locations and or even some of them on on their computer um, and generating revenue and I my my wife so my wife used to dance on um, as a background dancer for bands <laughs> you know, so she was she was up there and she toured and and I told her that I was like, did the bands do it for the love? The, you know, the, like, like, is it true that they they really want to go tour? Because Garth Brooks is talking about how he misses his fans. She goes, are you kidding me? She goes, it's, it's, just, it's just brutal. Like, like, it's just it's just brutal. And the bands are beaten. And and she goes, by the end of the tour, you're just like, oh, my gosh, I can't do this anymore. And and uh, and she said, she's, there's no she goes, yeah, for the first couple, it's it's really fun. But after that, she was just like, no, it's for the money, you know, like and and uh, and, and and you want to play every once in a while. You don't want to play 54 dates, you know, like that's the difference is that so the bands you know, can with a virtualized set setup, they can go out and, and play the song the number of times they want to play, but possibly be exposed to millions of people at one time and generate revenue from millions of people at one time. So they don't, they don't have to go out and tour to make money. They just tour when they want to. Uh, Michael, real quick, and we're going to have to go into speed round here because I have a hard out. Okay. Uh, I will say that there are plenty of bands that absolutely love to tour and live that way live to tour uh because just I mean, just for starters when they're on tour they get treated like a demigod right. when they're at home they still got to take out the trash and walk the dog <laughs> right right that's good that's good okay <laughs> yep next next question that's good. uh comes good from marty adius of silver springs maryland often panelist i've been thinking about offering remote mixing services to local bands doing streaming performances from home this would require a real-time audio channel for me to hear what's a good way to set up a real-time audio channel when the mixer is behind a home router short of setting up a virtual private network uh brian i mean unity connect is really as yeah. far as i'm concerned the only way to go so yep. unity connect and we're gonna talk more about that go ahead mickey yeah, being be behind a, a home router isn't an issue as long as you can pop holes and uh, do port forwarding. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we'll, and we'll do a second hour on Unity. Someone remind me by putting it into the second hour suggestions because we should definitely do a Unity Connect. Um, next question. Talak Lopez Waterman, our friend in New York, wants to talk to Doria, Daria or ask Daria about collaborating with others in her live remote situation. Is latency a deal breaker? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think this has been covered on the show quite a lot, but I mean, yeah. playing live online with other people who are in other locations is still really not a thing yet. Everybody wants yeah. it to be a thing. It's really not. And if anyone's going to crack it, it'll be Alex. So. <laughs> <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I think he, Alex might have been beaten to it. There's a company from Sweden called uh, Elk Audio who do the Aloha product. It's a hardware box that has super low latency and the audio doesn't touch the PC. It only goes into the audio box over the internet. They had a demo with a guy playing a guitar and his amp was 40 kilometers away and he couldn't tell the difference. Aloha, I, I, Jeff or Mickey, have you seen that? Have you? Uh, yeah, it's it? a uh, Raspberry Pi 
okay. uh, with audio input and Ethernet. So it skips your computer latency, but you still have internet latency. Right, sure. right. Mickey? Mickey? Yeah, yeah exactly that. Like, um, you're still limited by the latency of your internet connection. So, you know, a ping from me to, to say, you know, in ca to California would still be, you know, 100 or 200 milliseconds. Yeah, but there are countries that are smaller than the USA, so it works better in some of those. And 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 to, to Daria's point, I don't think I'll figure it out, but I think we will, we might. <laughs> if there's a way to do it, uh, you know, as, as I started pushing off to the folks that I that really know how to do this. Uh, next question. JJ McKenna is back with: Is there a safe way to ensure that a cover is legal? Something like a plagiarism checking tool for university students. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Pay the licensing fee. You're, you're allowed, as soon as a, uh, an artist has released a version, you're allowed to make as many cover versions of it as you want, as long as you pay the, uh, the, the Harry Fox? license fee. That's Harry Fox. Yep, it's a Harry set Fox. rate. You can negotiate a lower rate, but there is a set rate for that statutory And it's fee. usually not horrible. You know, like it's hundreds of dollars, I think, for most of them, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I Nine cents a copy. And you should switch, but, but it's different on license. license. Like, yeah. Yes, it so, is. So, um, yeah, Brian? Yeah, that's what I was wanting to differentiate. The mechanical license, which is compulsory, you pay it. But there are, streaming, I don't understand that. So how that divides up? We'll we'll do a second hour. So I'm put that, put that in the second hour of licensing uh, music because I don't fully understand it either, and I think it would be useful for us to talk about. Next question. I don't think intellectual property lawyers fully understand it. Chris Wilder, <laughs> uh, Lafayette, Indiana. For a, a kit for musicians, would it be possible to send a Raspberry Pi compute module for I/O board with dual cameras and some kind of USB audio interface, the way it would be a plug-in audio and internet and go? I think you could build some kind of small box. I think that that one starts to build up to where I would probably use other other tools. But I do think sending out like I, we're definitely working on kits for for home concerts, and so we'll we'll keep on sharing that as we get closer. Next question. Uh, Michael Sharon of Chicago says the joy of live events is interacting with a community for a streamed event. How do you enable audience interaction other than chat rooms and emojis? Well, again, I think that it's different. Um, I think that there, but I, I do think that the chat rooms are, are useful. I think breakout rooms before and after the shows. I think that um, interacting with, uh, you know, finding ways for them to vote things up and ask questions and be part of that that conversation are all things that are, that are possible. Go ahead, uh, Mickey. And yeah, we were talking that one time in the post show, Alex, like about like maybe having, uh, if if you are charging for the event, the event having tiered pricing, wherein like you know a more expensive ticket might allow you right. to be to do a meet and greet, for right. like you know fifteen minutes with the with with the artist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and the the I mean one of the things we've been talking about is turning votes and emojis into into lighting you know in the stage so that in front of the artist that things are going up and down based on people tapping on something we're afraid we might give them rsi but but it could be uh maybe like clapping uh and we were thinking you could even get it to a point where the app you can just shake you could just shake your phone like this and they they would see this big glow you know on you know from them uh from from people shaking their phones while they're while they're watching go ahead bill I was walking through the living room the other day and the view was left on from ABC and uh, I noticed they're trying and I think these are just baby steps. The whole industry is trying to incorporate audience participation. So they had a, a Hollywood mm -hmm. Squares like stack of people that they would cut to yep. occasionally and you can interact with that. I think it's pretty lousy at this point, but so are mm -hmm. all technologies that start out. Maybe something will hybrid between that and the Tony Robbins kind of millions on screen and, and find a way to make it functional and work so that you can have more audience interaction virtually. We have to remember, we, we've evolved a long way. I mean, if you go back and look at like solid gold from the eighties, you know, that we grew up on, it wasn't great. <laughs> like, like it's like, I mean, it's like, that, that's not a great, like, like we, we think like it, we've been doing this well, but we learning, you know, um, next question. Moving on to Andrew Lipnick of San Francisco uh, and in the band. Does the audience care if the band together in some physical room playing live or in an interactive event or if they are in different distant locations follow up? Will we ever overcome the issues of latency causing some of uh, causing one of music collaborators platforms problems? Go ahead, Jeff. I think the audience does care. I think part of what we love about music is the interaction between people and that interaction needs that really tiny latency that real world gives and also it's the visual cues sometimes it's it's 
seeing a, a smile or a smirk or some kind of reaction on an artist's face to something another musician does. So that kind of interaction, we, we want that. I do think they can interact live in a performance with global click tracks. We've done it. So I know that that's possible. And then, and it's really only a, a small amount of shifting that makes it all tie together, but they're listening to, they're not listening to each other while they're playing. They're listening to each other in the past, you know, um, playing, um, but it allows you to stop and talk and then everything else. And then you start up the next song and you fire into it and um, it, it can be done. It's just that not over zoom because there's too much wow and flutter. You have to basically, the system has to reclock everything on the way back in as well. So you can't do it over zoom. You can have them interact. You can tie it together. They can be spontaneous to some degree, but they have to stick within the rails. Um, and, and then it has to be resynced on the way back out. Um, go ahead, Jeff. And then Bill. Not chamber music. Not chamber music. Nope. I'm talking about bands, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Not chamber music. Go, Bill. Yeah, I was just wondering, you just got the first time I've ever thought about it, but they have a delay for bad language on TV, you know, six seconds or whatever. I wonder if there is a system that could eventually evolve where AI synchronized the tracks in that bridge between performance and you live can... using a lot of big computers. It'd be interesting. Yeah, there's. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, you can do that. The trouble is, as Alex says, that the musicians want to hear each other, and they want to play off each other. So it's very hard to get that. Yeah, you can't can't do that. But you can you can. Uh, I mean, again, there are limitations to everything. Uh, anyway, I have a hard out. I have to. I'm afraid that I'm going to have to uh, close this up and jump into the post show. Um, but uh, I think this is a fun conversation. I, th I think we actually came up with some new thoughts um, about what we could do as we talked about it together. And that's what I was hoping for is kind of a creative back and forth uh, over, uh, over what that looks like. And now I'm, now I'm even more obsessed with concerts than I was before uh, because I think that there's some really interesting things that we came up with. So um, anyway, hopefully we'll play with some of those and actually um, do something with them. So thank you all uh, again amazing work on the questions for the audience and amazing work on the answers for the panelists. I think we, we turned some corner today where we were getting more focused and more like answering those questions during the time. And we're allowing that time in the pre-show and the pre-pre-show and the post-show to have those kind of more lingering conversations. But I think everyone's doing a great job. So anyway, see you soon. All right. Uh, and uh, we're going to go to the post-show. Remember, remotes tomorrow. <laughs>